Well, good evening and welcome. This is a great historic night because it's the first time we've had a, a strategic study session here in our Central Park Library, our beautiful Central Park Library. And hoping that we can have as the, the time goes on the opportunity to, to go and to hold meetings at different parts of our city. So this will be the first of uh, any session for we'll have the opportunity to move around geographically. We hope that while you're here, you enjoy the facilities. And if you haven't been here before, it's a wonderful jewel. Hope you return. So we'll go ahead and start the meeting. And I'll start, and I understand that it looks like we're going to call to order the meeting. And uh, we'll go ahead and we'll do the, uh, we'll do a confirmed confirmation of a quorum here, uh, Mr. Clerk. Confirming quorum. And then, of course, we'll have one of our council members that will be trailing behind. We have the opportunity for public presentations tonight. We'd love to hear from you. So we have some speaker cards um, to fill out. And the reason we're asking you to fill out speaker cards is really to help us so that we can keep in touch with you and we can keep track of everybody that's here. So we can, uh, Add you to the list of subjects to move forward. So, with that, I'll start with the first of the speaker cards. And if you feel inspired, um, please go around. Um, the first speaker card for the public presentations is Jerry Smith, and we'll be, uh, our clerk will be keeping track of the time as he normally does. So, Mr. Smith, come forward. Welcome, sir. Hi, Jerry Smith. Uh, please go ahead and sit down and speak oh, to the mic. Okay. Make sure everybody can hear you. Yeah, my name is Jerry Smith. Uh, long time resident of Santa Clara, home property in Santa Clara, uh, and been the women's soccer coach. Site and off-site, 
It means having access to public transportation, all the elements that, and all the reasons why you see more urban environments having low, low vacancies, higher rates, and increased demand. Areas like the downtown Palo Alto, sorry, Thanks. downtown Palo Alto is the world and all the rest. So I just also want to talk to the size of this project. We're talking about Centennial Gateway Office, about 430,000 square feet. In context to the size of these speculative developments that have been built, we've got 900,000 square feet at Santa Clara Gateway, over 2 million square feet at Moffat Towers down the road. Don't have a lot of time. Just really want to say that this is exactly what today's companies are looking for. Uh, I live in this type of environment and believe firmly that there will be substantial demand. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Day. I like, I like your, uh, your sound effects there. Uh, Peter Yu. Welcome, sir. Good evening. My name is Peter Nguyen. I'm a resident of Santa Clara. Um, I want to welcome all of you to our library. This is the best library. So I want to thank our city council for having the vision and build this library. Um, we are in this moment right now with related company and the Joe Montana Group. Um, our city's history is a history of successful work to supporting industry to develop offering a diverse, strong base of different business opportunities. Northside Santa Clara provide excellent opportunities for any developer with a proven record of successful place making of quality project which create synergy with other projects <coughs> in the area. Proposed project is a consistent with city's vision for Northside Library. Related company has successfully worked with over 20 cities throughout California. They intend to build a project that is true to the Santa Clara Bay which will bring gathering place for Santa Clara. Related company will enhance our entertainment, housing, restaurants, industries, stadiums, and hotels. Through this project, jobs will be created. In fact, many jobs will be created for Santa Clara. For last couple of years, we have lost a lot of money due to our shutdown. With related project, we have the opportunity to enhance revenue from interest income as well as retail tax revenue from business developed by each project. We may use both revenue streams as an important part of our general and capital fund that only increase our support of parks, athletic facilities such as youth soccer, park golf course, and international swim center, and police activity living program. So based on potential increase in city revenue by development of this project, we will have dramatically impacted our recreational and service program for the betterment of the community. This project will provide gathering place for all of us. Santa Clara is a city which honors the past and works hard in the present to ensure our future. By engaging with the related company and Jomon Dango, the council will use the formula that has served so well in the past. The bright future is ahead of us. Together, jobs will be created, revenue will increase, and service will be provided for the Santa Clara. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yu. Uh, just a reminder, I have uh, two minutes for our speakers, especially for people that came in. And if you'd like to speak, we have some speaker cards. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Nadine. Welcome, Dr. Nadine. Thank you, members of the Council. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. You know, since the RDA funds are gone, and over the next three to seven years, we needed some projects. I think Montana and related project, these are the right kind of projects that the city needs. I've been a resident of Santa Clara for the last 20 years. I have four children. I would like to have a better future, not only for myself, but my family and my children. I think these projects really provide opportunities for Santa Clara particularly uh, in terms of jobs and entertainment 
and, and related uh, family, sense of community. And the, the most important thing, what we're looking for in Santa Clara is place to go, place to have fun, take your family. Right now, I don't see that we have. And these projects provide that sense of community for Santa Clara. I'm strongly behind this project. I'm supporting this project. And thank you, John Montana and the related company for bringing such wonderful, wonderful project to Santa Clara. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nadine. Uh, Mr. Kevin Mark. Welcome, Kevin. Well, I don't know when it was, but maybe a year ago, I, I got a phone call and I thought one of my friends was pranking me because the message was, uh, this is Joe Montana, can I, uh, if you call me back regarding a development project? I'm going, okay, who, who called? It's got to be a prank call. But it wasn't, it was actually Joe wanting to build a restaurant, a hotel. I didn't think the plan would be this fantastic. I'm really excited to see what happens. The two words I think today that are important is economic development. Three of the council members here, Marcelli, um, I'll say last name, and, and Patricia Mahan and Lisa Gilmore, your fathers all served on this council, and they had this vision of someday doing a strong economic proposal like this. We never dreamed it would be as big as it was, we didn't. Um, the things that I like about this and the reason why the Montana project needs to move forward quickly is because we have to capitalize on the 50th Super Bowl. A lot of people said we're not going to get a Super Bowl, we're not going to get economic development. Some of the opposition, well, we have got the Super Bowl coming and we do have economic development. So the people who walk those precincts, what we heard and what the Chamber of Commerce and one of their studies I think it was said, People in Santa Clara want more activities, more things to do. They want to go to restaurants in our town. They want entertainment in our town. Here it is. Okay. The other two words are mellow ruse. So the Montana group, which is proposing hotels, the related group, which is proposing hotels, that mellow ruse goes into paying down the stadium. So that's just another extra bonus. But to be able to go and have restaurants, we have people from Los Gatos here, two different groups from Los Gatos, who have fine restaurants, who now want to have restaurants in Santa Clara. This is the kind of economic development that puts people to work, gives us more money, increases the value of our property. And today I'm, I'm fired up, and you should all be fired up. We're very lucky to be in the position we are. Let's just make sure that we move this forward along so we can take advantage of the Super Bowl. And I think that the parcel on the west parcel, especially where the hotels need to be done, need to be really focused on with the Montana group to make sure it's ready to go. Let's capture that money in Santa Clara. Thank you. Thank you. Mario Buza. Welcome, sir. Boy, isn't that great following Kevin Moore? So let me bring some excitement to this after Kevin. <laughs> Let me put it in, in simple words. When I started seeing this project, I always had an idea for that area to be an entertainment district, and especially to enhance our uh, convention center. When I saw the project that was coming, I was really excited, especially being part of the uh, golf course and developing something like, they said, unquote, steroids, uh, and steroids. Well, the things that I, that I saw is this area is you're gonna really, this is what redevelopment is. You're just a little bit late, they took it away from us, but guess what, this is what it was intended to be. Now think of this, all that area, that off of Lafayette, all that, the little area that was really neglected, all of that's coming to life. All those little uh, parcels of land that had some light industrial that could be revalorized. Now we have so much going on that, and there it's incredible. When I saw some of the proposals, it reminded me of like if you ever been to the Staple Pavilion uh, in LA that you walk through, or the uh, Universal uh, Studios City. That's what it looks like. It is really for fun for the city, and it's going to be attracting so much. Finally, our convention center is going to be looking in the black all the time. They could be expanding uh, hotels in the area. Just think of that. The Hyatt area, everything. It's just going to be going. You have Yahoo. Around there, you'll have NVIDIA. You also have Google expanding. So this is a fantastic project. Let's not just go ahead and, uh, this goal is going to be some naysayer, but this is always going to be, the pros are going to be here, the naysayer is going to be here. Just overlook it, and eventually we're going to get this done. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Michelle Tetch. Welcome. 
Lucia Pike and I represent Unite Here Local 19. We represent hospitality workers in Santa Clara at the Convention Center, at the Hilton, and soon workers at um, the new stadium. We understand that both developers are excited to bring new hospitality into this area and are hopeful that these jobs will be good jobs. Jobs that allow workers not just to work in Santa Clara, but allow them to live in Santa Clara, raise their families here, plan for futures here. Um, we look forward to continuing a good relationship with related companies and are optimistic that we'll have a good relationship with Low Enterprises and the Montana as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Van Dorn, Steve Van Dorn. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Steve Van Dorn. I'm the President and CEO of the Santa Clara Chamber of Commerce Convention and Visitors Bureau. These two projects are dreams that chambers look for uh, once in a lifetime. So, uh, well, actually two times because we have the stadium that was approved. So, uh, this is really exciting stuff. Um, we uh, really look forward to working uh, with the developers and the plans that they're putting together. I'm sure they're going to change a little bit. Uh, the convention center will be very successful with uh, these projects, obviously, um, as well as the hotel community that currently exists in the city. Uh, as we all know, the hotels are pretty full right now, so we need more hotel rooms. Uh, we, in fact, we'd like to see more hotel rooms in these projects. We'd also uh, like to see the convention center expanded. Um, as some of us know in this room, there are some big events coming up that are going to be using the stadium that, uh, unfortunately, our convention center is not big enough. So those events are going elsewhere. So we need to, we'd like to see that be part of this as well. So hopefully that can be part of the discussion. And um, thirdly, uh, I think we, we all need, know we need parking. Uh, so we hope there's plenty of parking that would be part of these designs. But overall, it's just a really exciting time to be in Santa Clara. And we look forward to uh, seeing this come to um, a positive end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bandar. Julie Mitchell? Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor and City Council. I'm Jody Meacham from Working Partnerships USA. Uh, we're excited about the uh, development projects proposed for the stadium. They're a major opportunity for the uh, community and have a regional significance. It's critical that they be done well. First, given the magnitude of the development plans, there should be a robust, transparent, and inclusive plan for community engagement which includes engagement of both the surrounding neighborhoods as well as the broader Santa Clara County community. Second, these projects must promote equity and inclusion. We have to ensure that we are investing this resource of public land wisely and to the benefit of the broad public. Community benefits would include affordable housing in any residential portion of the projects, ensuring that all jobs created in the project area meet a basic living wage standard, providing employment opportunities for local residents as well as opportunities for local small businesses and disadvantaged contractors, quality urban design that emphasizes walkability and safety for pedestrians and connectivity to the transit system. Given their scale and scope, these projects should set a standard for the type of development and type of jobs we want to create in our community. We're excited to work with the city, the community, related, and the Montana group on these important projects. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Benfield? Welcome, oh, Mr. Field. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, my name is Ben Field. I'm the Executive Officer of the South Bay Labor Council. Uh, while these two projects on uh, their surface look very similar, and in fact, need to be a uh, coordinated part of a site development. Um, they uh, have to date been somewhat different. Um, while the, the related folks have been um, making an effort to outreach to the community <coughs> and, and talk about providing community benefits and good quality local jobs, the Low Montana group has not to date, and that is something of real concern. I wanted to make sure that uh, the Council was aware of that difference. Uh, we are looking forward to working with both the Low and Montana group and the related group uh, toward, toward a project that is coordinated and a real benefit to the city and all of its residents. And uh, we, we hope that it uh, provides good quality local jobs for, for all. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Reginald Spoke. <coughs> Welcome, sir. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you again. Uh, I'm Reginald Slowey with the Minority Business Consortium. And uh, I've said it before, I'm really proud of, of what you are doing here. And I think you are becoming a model for the country for what can be done in a community like this. I think these developments and these opportunities, uh, you're making some very good steps in pressing this community forward. Uh, we work with uh, minority chambers, uh, labor, and all the, all the business communities around. We, what we are trying to do, is, and hoping that you make an issue of, is that is doing a particular outreach to the minority business community. Some of the emerging businesses and the emerging construction companies have an opportunity in a project like this will be beneficial not only to uh, their particular businesses, but to this community as a whole. And we think that, that um, PLAs and, and advancing the kind of issues that build the community from the bottom up will be very advantageous. I think that that principle that you've started uh, here in this city will be very effectual as you go forward with it. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to that coming from this group and that, that you stay ahead of the curve in, in the business that you're bringing to this community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Philly. Uh, do we have any additional cards? Um, so seeing none, is there anyone, so make sure you don't miss anyone. And remember, you can talk on any of the items that we have on the agenda, uh, not just the development proposals, it's kind of public agenda. Come on forward, Mr. Hill, Welcome, sir. Michael Heller, a Santa Clara resident. Uh, I get a great sense, obviously, of, of excitement for this project. I think a lot of it follows from the uh, momentum of the uh, stadium, which I did also work with precincts for. In fact, uh, my wife and I have bought uh, two seats for the, the uh, stadium and I was looking forward to uh, September of 2014. Uh, I appreciate that one of the speakers talks about organizing this management, being inclusive on, on a <coughs> local basis. One of the comments in the paper has said it's exciting. We're actually creating a city within a city. I'd like that city to be Santa Clara still. If I can still be Santa Clara, I want to compete with San Pedro and uh, San Jose or San Francisco. It should still be Santa Clara. Uh, one point that uh, I want to make sure that we think about the general plan, 2010 general plan said we would have uh, tried to maintain uh, 2.4 acres per 1,000 residents. I'd like to see that there's about 500 acres at that time. We're talking potentially of 80 acres of the golf course, uh, 48 or I guess it's 45 acres of the BMX track. We talked about those would be relocated. I just want to make sure they are relocated. We had the issue last night when we talked about the youth soccer park. I just like to have the relocation already in place before they start putting shovels into the golf course. I don't mean to be negative on it because I am very uh, positive, very excited about it. I just want to make sure that we are looking at the full thing, looking at it as a Santa Clara project. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <coughs> Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this or any other item that we have on our agenda? <coughs> uh, please come forward, sir. Give your name, and if you'd like to be contacted by email in the future, this is why the cards are important. Uh, let the clerk know your email address so that we push on the list. My name is Silvano, and uh, uh, council. I run a tennis program with the courts there. And the gentleman before I had a good point. Uh, I'd like to know what the uh, relocation because I run a program for like seven years there. And I know they're building a beautiful Montana hotel, and it's really good for the community and everything. But uh, we also have uh, I coach a lot of kids, and people play a lot of golf. and we have golf programs there in the summer. And, uh, and also I know David over there has a restaurant over there too, so uh, there's a lot of people in that area that were uh, affected. And uh, when they made the garage over there, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty brutal. Uh, the dust and uh, the courts got really bad and uh, I asked them many times to help me clean it out and I cleaned it out. So I know that may be a negative comment uh, to this uh, council, but 
but just the voice of the people that, that were there then impacted. So uh, if the city could, uh, my Santa Clara city could think about that, it would be great. Uh, maybe we could find a little of the courts or maybe you can, uh, uh, maybe a little small golf course somewhere and maybe another uh, tennis center because I, I deal with a lot of kids that are five year old, fully till 18. Anyway, um, that's very important too, so. Anyway, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Please come forward. Yeah. Thanks. Welcome, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm glad you're having this uh, public to speak. And I've been following this whole development. I've lived in the city for 30 years. I used to work at the city, too. Uh, my name is Ken Kratz. And uh, I'm very worried about air quality in the city. I think you're going to have a problem uh, with all the additional car trips and, and traffic in the area. Uh, as you know, the jobs that they're proposing here are primarily retail, and uh, those folks probably won't be able to live in that community that's developing out there. So you'll need uh, a heavily amount of uh, public transit to get those folks out there. So you might want to think about a component in that sense. Uh, Santana Road is heavily uh, uh, covered by, well not heavily, but it has a lot of public transit to that center, so it allows people to work there uh, who probably can't afford to live there. I know I could never afford to live there as I worked at the city. I went over there several times to see what it was rent for, and it was basically uh, almost double what the rentals are in the city of Santa Clara. And now I'm talking about the old sections, uh, you know, south of 101 and, and uh, the Atmin area. So I, I don't think this is going to add housing to the city in any considerable amount. And I would suggest you start looking at housing in the following way. It's build a real city. San Jose has an equal balance between housing and jobs. Santa Clara doesn't. And you know this. And you've known it for a long time. You're about three times the population out there in the day as there is at night. We need to start working on that imbalance. So I would suggest you start thinking about putting some housing out there and forget about uh, uh, a lot of this retail that you're talking about, and all this other stuff. Parking, you've got the 49er problem with parking. Let's solve that first. You're out of kids some parking. Let's put some parking in that footprint where the building wants to go. Let's get that taken care of because we've got that stadium way pretty much built. So let's work on that first. Thank you, Mr. Kratz. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to this issue? Or any other issue that we have in our strategic plan before we start making presentations? <coughs> well, welcome, sir. <clears throat> My name is James Viso, um, and uh, I think this is an area is an excellent area to do this. Um, you got the implications of the Santana Road, uh, excellent uh, foot traffic, uh, creates a place of destination, which a lot of young kids don't have a place to go where you can go um, you know, to the movies, to to restaurants. Um, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's almost a city within a city. You know, when, where else do you have uh, 230 acres to uh, really make an impact with the city? Uh, with the city of Santa Clara lacking a downtown, I feel like this would be uh, an excellent uh, place to start as far as uh, restaurants with wide sidewalks, people to ride their bikes, uh, walk their dogs. Um, and I really feel like this would uh, reinvent um, Santa Clara for a place of destination. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there someone else here who would like to speak? Don't be shy. <coughs> Question for the mayor. On the swim center, the mayor will speak on that later. Why don't we, we're going to take the public speaking on all of the items that we have on our strategic plan. So if we want someone wants to speak to the swim center, or somebody wants to talk to about the uh, El Camino Real <coughs> partnerships or the five years to plan. This is a good time to do it. I'll just make a brief statement. Um, I'm all excited about the Swim Center. Um, I'm going to keep it brief. This is an opportunity for us to get the International Swim Hall of Fame. It is just the least expiring in Florida. Uh, we were the swim capital of the world. Uh, we all know about that. Uh, we're looking at redoing the Swim Center. We haven't been able to get it done. I'm really excited about the current administration of the, of the city. They look like they're dedicated to do it. I know you're dedicated to make that happen. Um, it's not just about the swimming and the success we've had all the gold medals, but it's about swim safety, water therapy, and a lot of other things. By adding the Swim Hall of Fame, we should have all the history for swimming in the world. 
in our location. We will recapture being smooth top of the world, and it'll be exactly what I said earlier, another attraction for people to go to. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to any of the items on our strategic plan? Come on forward, sir. Looks like whoever gets there first. <laughs> <laughs> The man with the hat's got the advantage. He's a little closer. Okay. One bigger. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, sir. I'm James Jones. I've been here for several times in front of the city uh, council. Um, but uh, the last time that I went before the city council was when they took out the Fairway Glen Golf Course. Okay? And the answer was we got a real nice golf course up there. We built it. How we're going to take this one out. Yes, sir. We need to make sure that, you know, as far as a lot of my friends, that the golf course isn't just eliminated. It is a, a, an extremely good golf course, and now all we're talking about is just taking it out or using it for a parking lot. Um, there's a lot of golfers around that choose to make that more than a parking lot. Yeah. Um, I still enjoy it. My wife says I'm getting too old for the game anyway, but I just, just uh, I enjoy the game. And, a lot of these uh, developments are very good. I've been in Santa Clara for 50 years. Okay, I have property here to support the tax base and everything. And um, all of these are very good projects. But at the same time, I don't want to see some of the people that's been here a long time like myself just moved over so they can bring in the new crowd. Uh, I think you know, with just a little bit of forethought, uh, both things can be taken care of. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> My name is Jeff Sloan. I'm a Santa Clara resident, uh, a homeowner. In fact, I can see the stadium from the front door. And uh, I'm an avid golfer and tennis player. I know John uh, Davis Restaurant is well used as well. So it's fantastic because I eat there. I'm just concerned about the big development that's happening with the traffic coming in. Um, we have enough traffic as it is now on Tasman. And uh, in fact, it was a mess. It's calmed down now since uh, the construction is winding up. But I had three or four flat tires in a month, and I had to, and that expense was on me. I, I mean, finally, they got sweepers coming in and fixing that. But, uh, you know, that was an expense out of my pocket, I didn't appreciate it. Uh, and to see the thrill of these kids playing tennis, and, and, and I watch it because I'm there all the time. Uh, and the, and the, um, the soccer field, those kids there, I have a friend that's a coach over there. So these, the, those facilities are very well used. And uh, to hear something like a, an executive nine-hole golf course, I don't think we need something like that. And, and when I go golfing in other areas, pretty close to this, this area, like Spring Valley, uh, Santa Teresa. I hear a lot of other golfers uh, mentioning Santa Clara Golf Course as, as a really nice course, and it's developed into a nice course. So maybe maybe we can even make it nicer or a pro course and, and keep that interest there. Uh, I'm, I'm planning on, on having a big event at David's Restaurant in 2015, uh, and, and I don't know if I should cancel it or go ahead and, and with my plan, so that was something I would like to answer because I, I mean, my father lives in Los Gales, so I haven't come down here and uh, he, he likes the whole area as well. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slum. Is there anyone else here who'd like to speak to any of the items on the agenda? Seeing none, then we'll go ahead and the council's going to switch sides so we can. Uh, get out of your way so you can see the presentation that we can as well. So we'll go ahead and start with the presentation on the Montana and related development proposals. I'll um, turn this over to city staff if it's okay. Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, uh, we're very happy this evening to roll out for the first time uh, the two site plans uh, involving uh, the two commercial developments uh, within this given area. Uh, there has been uh, coverage uh, regarding the, uh, the projects because we wanted to make sure that we uh, 
reached out to the media and the community to give everyone ample notice that, uh, that these two site plans are going to be discussed uh, tonight. Uh, the plans overall are very ambitious. They're incredible projects. Uh, they seem to hit on all cylinders as it relates to office, retail, entertainment uses, hotels, housing, it includes a market, certainly restaurant <coughs> components. Uh, the plan itself, as I mentioned, uh, is the first rollout. Uh, because it is, uh, these plans um, uh, need to be vetted. They need to be certainly reviewed, obviously. Uh, and these plans could change depending on uh, your uh, guiding principles and your expectations of, of the development. Uh, as you go through the plans tonight with the developers, um, we want you to look at a number of design considerations as it relates to how uh, the plans are laid out overall. You know, we need to look at density uh, as an issue, height, bulk of buildings. Uh, we also need to look at uh, the new infrastructure that's going to be developed. Um, you know, the podium platform that will be developed over the former landfill uh, uh, area, because that is the uh, podium and the floor that will hold these, uh, these individual buildings as they're constructed. We definitely need to look at compatibility, especially with surrounding uses and neighborhoods. Uh, parking should be a huge consideration. Access, circulation, uh, especially as it relates to pedestrian vehicle. Uh, overall land uses, to make sure that they're consistent with what the community wants. Landscape issues transportation. And the final issue uh, would be the, uh, the gateway effect of the visibility to what is being built in that particular area. And as you deal with the retail community, uh, a lot of it deals with uh, location and visibility. Everyone wants to be noticed as people drive by so that they can uh, attract customers to, to sell their wares and their products and their goods. So we'll need to take a look at uh, those issues. Um, you know, the project uh, in itself is something special. Um, I was indicated in the paper that we are building a city within a city. And I agree with the gentleman who spoke earlier. Uh, it should have all of the uh, characteristics, the marking, and the identity of Santa Clara. Uh, because uh, it is the city that we're here to serve. Uh, but it is a special, uh, special opportunity. Um, when you look at the development of the city in general, and you look at the needs uh, that we have, uh, this project, or these two projects, I should say, will, uh, will certainly address many of those needs. Um, as we look at the city as a whole, uh, this is actually a very good start in terms of uh, trying to bring, especially retail into the community, because it's certainly going to be the lead in, uh, in a number of uh, projects to come in the near future. So uh, what I'd like to do at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ruth Shikata, our economic development manager. And what she will do is she will introduce the, uh, the development teams and the principals and uh, give you a brief update. Uh, for many of you, we have really been working on these, uh, on these plans uh, since, since March. I know the Montana group had been here a little longer in terms of their ENA, but uh, related, uh, we've been hustling uh, and trying to coordinate and, and essentially master plan both developments. And what you're going to see here tonight is uh, somewhat the, uh, the first culmination of, of some of that work. Uh, and again, like I said, it's not etched in stone. There could be changes. But uh, it should be an incredible presentation tonight. So we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Julio. Uh, Mr. Mayor and the members of the City Council, <coughs> pleased to introduce these two tremendous projects tonight. Um, we'll have two separate presentations, so I just wanted to take a minute to introduce the principles that will be um, in front of you. Um, from uh, the first block, we'll have the Montana Way Flow Group. Um, Joe Montana is here, Kurt Wittick, and Bob Lowe are the three principals from the Montana Way Flow Group. Um, after that, then we will have uh, another presentation uh, from the related company, and they uh, will be represented by Bill Wittick <coughs> and Steve Eimer. Um, as you can imagine, uh, planning for a brand new district of this size is a significant undertaking. What we're looking at between the two projects is a combined total of more than 60 million square feet of development, more than 18,000 parking spaces, and more than 220 acres. 
Um, so to that end, the city has spent a significant time um, working with the two groups, um, coordinating their, their site plans. Um, and to help us with that effort, we, I also want to make one more introduction. Um, Frank Fuller from Field Paoli has um, come um, on the city team to help us um, look at the design principles, site planning efforts, to make sure that um, the, the pieces of the public realm are coordinated. As one person um, spoke a little bit earlier tonight, uh, looking at things like walkability and connectivity, uh, to make sure that the district, our new district um, in the north part of town is uh, welcoming to anybody who comes and visits it. We also need to recognize that uh, we have the, the brand new stadium is a major anchor. It's a regional anchor, really. And then how do these developments then um, play off of that as, um, as, a, as a partner and um, to create those synergistic efforts. So uh, tonight, as uh, the, the city manager alluded to, these are our preliminary plans. Uh, there's a lot of work still that needs to be done. Uh, we, we will need to be talking about in the future the, the site boundaries and the existing uses. You heard tonight from uh, folks that are uh, representing the, the golf constituency tennis and, and uh, David's was, was mentioned tonight. Um, we need to work with uh, the local, the county and state regulators because we can't forget that this is a landfill site and uh, there is a, a, a lot of regulations to make sure that human health and safety is protected. Um, we've also got to work through the CEQA. Uh, again, preliminary plans tonight, and once we start solidifying those development proposals, then we'll start looking at launching an EIR process, which will then uh, provide for additional layer of community engagement, as another speaker said tonight. Um, and then uh, we've also got um, term sheets to work on, uh, the, the transactions. So we, um, a lot of work has been done, but a lot more needs to be Okay, so with that, I think I will um, then introduce first have the Montana group come up, the Montana Winnick Willow team. Since the last time we were here and spoke before you, we have added a new member to our team. Uh, we went out and did a lot of research, extensive interviews, and decided wholeheartedly to bring on Low Enterprises as a partner in our endeavor. And we tonight we are uh, would like to proudly introduce them to you tonight uh, here at this meeting. And who better to do that than the chairman and CEO of Low Enterprise, Bob Lowe. Thank you, Joe. Good evening. I'm Earl Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, we're uh, couldn't be more excited than to be partners with Joe Montana and Kurt Wittig uh, in this exciting town and this exciting project. My associates and I are very pleased to, there we go, uh, to be here this evening to present to you uh, our preliminary plans for the old uh, uh, gateway. <coughs> 
Well, Enterprises is a California-based firm that we founded uh, in 1972. During the 40 plus years since, we have uh, acquired, developed, managed in excess of $21 billion of real property assets. We currently are responsible for over $5 billion of office, urban housing, hospitality assets around the country. We currently have uh, about a billion and a half dollars of mixed use urban projects similar to the Centennial Gateway project. Uh, our hotel company, uh, in our portfolio, we operate about 11,000 hotel rooms around the country and employ about 10,000 people. We focus on the development and management of very high quality assets. Our firm is known for creating a brand for each property in which we're involved that recognizes the unique aspects and the local market conditions of that asset. Uh, the Terranea Resort is our most recently completed uh, hotel, resort, conference center uh, on the coast in Southern California. Our portfolio includes world-class resorts and, and very high-quality urban hotels. Our current focus of our company is mixed-use development with a hotel base in those projects. The Washington, D.C. Hilton uh, is known uh, in Washington, D.C. as having the largest ballroom in the city. The Eden Rock Hotel in Miami Beach is the newest hotel in our portfolio of managed properties. Our commercial expertise is in Class A office properties as well as urban housing. The Idea District in San Diego will include uh, urban residential, office, and retail properties. The City Vista project in Washington, D.C. was a mixed-use residential and uh, retail project in downtown Washington, D.C. We, we have been active and continue to be active in Northern California and locally on the peninsula. We were an early developer of an office project in Mission Bay. We uh, have recently completed the rehabilitation, redevelopment of an office park in San Mateo uh, where a golf pro, the the uh, uh, digital camera, GoPro, excuse me, the digital camera uh, company has made their corporate headquarters. Uh, just down the road in North San Jose, we are beginning the development of a two million square foot uh, uh, creative <coughs> office camera. The bottom line, is we are experienced, we are local, and we are very, very excited to work with Joe, Montana, and Kurt Wittick in the city of Santa Clara to bring to reality the development on this really outstanding site that serves as the entrance to your new 49 football stadium. I'm pleased now to introduce you Hans Lee, who leads our Northern California office We'll be joined by Greg Wittig to discuss in more detail our plans for Centennial Gateway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kurt Wittig, part of the Montana Property Group. I want to speak to you briefly about uh, the excitement in our organization about the opportunity uh, for which we're afforded here and speak a little bit about the vision uh, that we hope to bring to this project and the evolution of that vision. Uh, we're looking to uh, capture and, and build on the momentum that the city of Santa Clara has obviously created in bringing the 49ers here in an NFL stadium and venue. And there are obviously a number of other demographic and business trends afoot in the Silicon Valley marketplace that we hope to answer to. 
uh, one of the previous speakers spoke to the co competition for talent among the technology companies today that exist in this marketplace. And it's obviously acute in, in Silicon Valley, this being the, the mecca of creativity and uh, it's attracting ever greater numbers of the young, talented, creative workforce that want to come here and seek their fortunes and go to work and live and play and do all the things that, that people do in, the, in their lives. And any real estate developer uh, jumps at the opportunity to be uh, a part of something as big as a, uh, a district being created around a stadium. I think in the, in the NFL today, the trend is to weave uh, stadiums into the urban fabric and our vision for our project is to create a unique urban scale destination development with a, uh, a mix of uses including hotel, office, uh, restaurants and entertainment that would answer the bell, if you will, on the, the quest for uh, these mixed use environments that the young and talented are gravitating towards and the companies who seek their services want to make themselves a part of. So our project is looking to uh, build on the obvious momentum uh, that the, that the uh, stadium has already established in the area. And we recognize the, the uh, relationship that we have to the related development and we've been working uh, extensively with them to try to master plan the region, if you will. But most important to us is to provide a destination where we can have a 24-7 environment of, of work, entertainment, restaurants, and uh, hospitality that candidly is lacking in much of the product in the Silicon Valley uh, marketplace today. Much of it is dated. Uh, if you speak to any of the very progressive companies, the Googles and uh, Amazons and, and Apples of the world, they all seek to create these vibrant, urban, walkable campuses with an array of services, amenities, and such that they're, uh, hopefully, uh, employees are gonna be attracted to and would enhance the quality of life. So the somewhat blurred lines that have come to exist in today's world between the, the uh, work environment and the social environment, and people are socializing while working and working while socializing, uh, the atmospheres that companies seek to create is, very similar to what we will seek to create on our site, where we combine the uses and, and create an urban, uh, urban scaled uh, walkable uh, place where there's a interplay of these uh, different restaurants and entertainment uh, uh, venues, as well as uh, with the office. And clearly, um, as Hans will walk you through when he shows some of the details of our proposal, we are also very mindful of our public spaces and the need to be inviting and to draw in the public during game days and play upon the obvious destination that an NFL stadium creates uh, so that we can become a part of the experience that is attending an NFL game and our eateries and restaurants, um, not the least of which will be one owned and operated by Joe, um, will obviously become destinations in their own right during the, uh, the game days and Clearly because uh, an NFL stadium exists and the energy that it exudes, uh, we think we will be able to capitalize on that energy and uh, bring it into existence in uh, a lot more than just game days or event days, but by planning the public space and the mix of uses in such a way to, uh, combined with related projects, create a critical mass of, of entertainment and other lifestyle uh, events that people would um, take advantage of not only during game days but uh, during the rest of the year. And lastly, um, as NFL game days are experiences, so too have become uh, daily life for people and especially this creative set that I think the, uh, the Silicon Valley marketplace is home to uh, more than their share of. Um, retail uh, of the type that related is uh, going to create behind us and uh, various um, entertainment and restaurants uh, combined together create an experience uh, not dissimilar from uh, that at Santana Row and the type of experience retail restaurants and such is part of what people seek today 
and by playing upon the energy of the stadium, whether there's an event there or not, and creating appropriate public spaces to move people through, uh, we think that we'd be uh, perfectly suited as a gateway to the uh, related project that comes uh, soon down the road. And it also is important to us that uh, we do this in a timely fashion, such that we could take advantage, at least on part of our development, uh, of being there welcoming the world uh, for Super Bowl 50 in early 2016. And I think no, so, no small part of that um, uh, is, is lost on the rest of the world that um, Joe is involved in the project. And I think his name and involvement um, along with the football nature and the 49ers stadium nature of the project is probably not lost on anybody. And uh, Hans will walk you through some of the details of our project. <coughs> Let me take you through our project, uh, get into the details a little bit here. Um, as we look at the immediately surrounding neighborhood, we're mindful of how our proposed project will relate to the convention center, the city garage, the future project by Related, and the stadium, of course. A major element of design is to create a sense of place, which we will achieve with public spaces that address both the stadium as well as the golf course site where related will be. To the south, the experience will be highly energetic, centered not only around events at the stadium, but also around activities that we will program ourselves. To the north, we're funneling pedestrians towards the oasis that will be related's town center. We've organized our site with the hotel to the west, by locating it on the west parcel, the hotel better addresses the convention center and the stadium. The plaza will be lined with storefront retail with a heavy focus on a wide range, range of restaurants as well as entertainment <coughs> and venues. To the east, we have the office buildings, which will include additional ground floor retail and also having most of that focused on food and beverage. And on the corner of Centennial Tasman, you see a feature retail space, which is where Joe is planning his own signature restaurant. The numbers are hard to read, um, but here you see the specific program, and I'll walk you through it, which includes an upscale, seven-story, 200-room hotel, as well as a future hotel or residential tower with another approximately 125 rooms. The office buildings will be eight stories. We think it's important to program a level of density uh, a density that creates a critical mass of people that, is, that will provide on-site demand for the restaurants that we plan to bring to the project and also have a nice sense of relative scale to the stadium itself. Here you can see our specific uses of the ground level. The fuchsia represents the retail, so you can see that the plaza will be a very activated space. And then going up, you can see uh, Above the ground level, the uses then transition from second stories and on up uh, to the other uses of the hotel shown in orange and the office shown in blue and parking, of course, in dark blue. We also want to assure you that the buildings have sufficient parking. The calculations here show that we are building nearly 2,700 parking spaces. Over one half of this parking is required for office much of which will be available on weekends and therefore should support the weekend uses, such as events and at the stadium. Lastly, we want to give you a sense of the economic benefit of the project. Nearly a thousand jobs will be created, with over 600 of those being permanent. Over $2 million in bedroom tax generated from the hotels when stabilized, another million and a half in sales tax and property taxes, and finally, payments for the land itself, which of course is maximized by allowing us to develop the level of density that we're proposing. The sooner we're able to proceed with the project, the sooner these benefits become real. So at this time, I'd like to turn it back to Joe to finish up for us. Well, I can only, I want to just finish up by saying that we're, we're extremely excited about our project. Um, 
Um, we think that our project will, as I said earlier, help fulfill that vision that the city has um, about the area surrounding um, the stadium and what they want to see there. Um, we, <laughs> we've been ready for a long time. We, we were ready back in July. Um, we were then asked by the city to uh, delay our application. And we, from that point on time, we have spent many, many hours and many, many dollars meeting with related and trying to uh, together plan um, and, and build our site plans together. And, and I'm here today just to say that you know, we're ready to go. And we're, we're just asking you to let us go ahead with that application so that we can, for sake, hopefully make that Super Bowl, because the longer we keep getting pushed back, the tighter and harder it is for us to make that. Um, Super Bowl, you wanted it, and it is coming. Right? It, it is coming. And everybody knows that it is, if not, most people consider it the greatest sporting event in the world. And it's coming, and with it come people from all over the country and all over the globe, not just people from the United States. And we believe that our project will enhance their experience while they're here. And so we are asking that uh, you allow us to move forward with this. Um, it certainly would be much better to, for them when they come here to see that Centennial Gateway sign hanging over a beautiful project other than staple to some piece of wood up against the chain link fence saying Centennial Gateway coming soon under construction. So we, we're here and, and we're just asking uh, for you to have that understanding and hopefully we can move this forward and, and start some uh, the beginning of something great for the city. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you, Mr. Montana. Uh, there's nothing we love more than hearing we're ready to go. Uh, you know, in Santa Clara, those are, those are words that are a call to action. And I'm especially excited about the team that you've assembled and the due diligence that you've done to date. It's obvious that you're, that you're ready to move forward. I wanted to go ahead and have an opportunity uh, for any council members if they have any questions related to the presentation, which was very well done, and I appreciate it. Thank you, council members. Council member Gilmore. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for the presentation. Um, it's nice to see it for the public and the council as a whole. See this really um, on the field for the first time. And I'm very proud of the team you put together. I think there was a misconception that for some reason um, you were delaying the project when, in, in fact, it was the city that was asking you to work cooperatively and collaboratively with the related company. And we have actually delayed your project. So thank you for being patient with us and uh, working together for the greater good of the proposed project. I'm hoping, I don't see any reason why this can't, um, you can't submit your application and start the process with the city. We would also like you to uh, be up and running, assuming everything um, moves forward as we're hoping and anticipating that it will, that you're up and running by Super Bowl because it's important for us that uh, we make a good impression on the world in, during the Super Bowl so that we can get another Super Bowl and by the time we get our second Super Bowl we'll have the related project also hopefully completely developed and um, we will have people staying here and spending all their money in Santa Clara and not in other cities so um, I think it's very important that we move ahead at least uh, with your project to get it going and get your application into the right away and let's start the, the public process. But thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Van? Uh, thank you, thank you for that presentation. I had a couple of questions on the way the project breaks down. What kind of hotel rooms are you anticipating? Because I'm doing some math here at you know the square footage you're proposing with the number of rooms you're proposing. It comes up pretty high square footage per room, and some is residential, so I wondered how much you had in mind in that, and then what kind of retail uses are you anticipating? Um, I can speak to the hotel uses. Uh, uh, my name is Matt Walker. I, uh, I oversee a hospitality development for low enterprises. Uh, <coughs> um, 
We're planning a 200-room hotel, which works out to roughly 125,000 square feet. So that would be a combination of hotel rooms along with the ground floor public space, restaurant, and, and meeting space. Uh, we're also planning a second phase that could either be a hotel or residential, uh, and that would be a smaller 125-room hotel. That would be you know, approximately 100,000 square feet. <coughs> okay, Project Zoning says 180,000 square feet on that 200 room hotel. Is that not correct? Uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. 180,000 square feet. 180,000 square feet for the 200 rooms, yes. Um, and has anyone done any kind of hotel renovation on the assessment, needs assessment survey to see what the demand's going to be? I guess, well, that's just that uh, We're in the marketplace all the time, all over the country. Not, not least for those which uh, here in the Bay Area. We think that uh, we think that Santa Clara, in particular, near the convention center, is right for additional hospitality rooms. When you look at the convention center um, and you speak to the other hoteliers in the area, you hear time and time again, we're losing convention space because it's not a critical mass of hotel rooms. So we think that Santa Clara is ready for uh, additional hotel rooms. And in fact, there are, there are plans uh, for expansion from, from other hotels. Uh, when you look at the uh, when you look at the hospitality market itself, um, both anecdotally and empirically, uh, but let me interrupt because I don't disagree. In fact, I'm looking at this as being too few rooms, not too many. That's what I'm trying to get to. I mean, I would answer, I would have anticipated that this site would have had more hotel rooms, given the fact that you are the choice location for stadium events. Um, we, we think it's important to create a hotel that is feasible. For us, we believe the first phase hotel at about that 200 room size is the right number of hotel rooms uh, to complement the existing mix of rooms given our location relative to the uh, convention center. We also believe that uh, taking the hotel more upscale is the right direction to go as, as well. And we think that uh, Santa Clara is ready for uh, uh, for that group of hotel guests that is looking for that innovative, uh, personalized, customized hospitality experience uh, and something that's got an entertainment uh, component to it and a fully integrated uh, restaurant and hospitality experience, which is what we're looking for. And what are the retail uses you're anticipating? I mean, when we say retail, we mean primarily restaurant on the ground floor and uh, there would be, uh, those would be complemented by some entertainment uses uh, uh, up above. Again, when you talk to hoteliers, uh, they say what we really need in the convention center area are more restaurants. We need a reason uh, uh, when you come to uh, book a convention and you want to go off site for that second night that there's a, that there's a collection of fine uh, quality restaurants. And we've uh, talked to a lot of potential restaurateurs that can't wait to come across the street for the new 49th stadium. And how does your site plan ensure that it's going to articulate well with the next project over, the related project, and also provide you know, easy access over to our convention center so you get those people coming over? We've spent, um, as, as you've heard, we've spent a lot of time over the past couple months, and I think, it's been, I think it's been effective. In the end, I think both projects are better for it. Uh, we have come up with a, uh, a, a neighborhood block program. So the project is divided into a series of blocks. And what we're really looking to create is another, a new downtown for Santa Clara. Um, and we do that for a couple of reasons. We think that, uh, we think that, that will provide easy access between the two projects. We've got um, a set of mutually agreeable design principles that include wide sidewalks uh, along Tasman and along Centennial that will uh, facilitate uh, lots of uh, large groups of people going between the projects. Uh, there's a porosity, uh, if you will, uh, by having a set of streets so that you've got people that can ample uh, their way through. And it just gives it a sense of authenticity that this is a, this is a place that really is uh, about creating the new Santa Clara. And what about Centennial Boulevard? It seems kind of like it's it doesn't give that grand entrance feel, probably because it seems a little narrow given the size of the surrounding buildings or just that your project. So we've had, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about Centennial Boulevard, the width of Centennial Boulevard should be grand or should be less grand. In the end, we felt that it was important to create an urban gateway. And for us, we look, I mean, we looked at, when you look at cities across the world, the distance between the streets was important. And if you made that distance too large, 
while we need to um, while we need to be responsive to the traffic and uh, the traffic needs that are going to be coming in and out and, um, and accommodate those. If you make that distance too large, you're going to make it more difficult for people to cross the street. And for us, we really want to encourage the pedestrian flow of traffic. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Councilmember O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation this evening. So I wanted to um, kind of tag on to some of the issues that Councilmember Mayhan raised because when I was looking at this, because I know there's some grade variations out there, and you know, we've got the you know the light rail track. So I was kind of when I look at the picture, I wasn't sure is you know are are you planning to bring the level up to street level? You know, what are you, how are you going to handle those grade variations? And it looks like, is that a, like a, some kind of walkway across the street on the pictures? It looks like some kind of walkway. So because if it's going to truly be a gateway, I have kind of concern how that, with the grade variations and how that's going to look. That issue was raised in our work sessions with Related, and we have submitted uh, a plan, if you will, that would raise the grade of, of Centennial, and, you know, day one, well and allow for further grading uh, to take place per the related specs at a later date when their project is developed. We we are amenable to raising the grade or to leaving it the way it is and our project will become whatever it needs to in order to accommodate that. Um, and it's important for us to, to explain it. We want to create a, a, a public plaza that is on the level of the stadium so that you walk out of the stadium, you cross the Tasman, and you come onto the public plaza on our side that is at that level. We will have podium parking underneath, so that, uh, and you'll, you'll use the natural depression of the plaza piece to build our property up onto that area. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments from the council members? Um, seeing none. Thank you so much for your presentation. This is a great first look, uh, much more than I, than I think than uh, any of us even expected, but we're very pleased to see how far along you are and how much thought you put into the design of the project and the great team that you put together, Mr. Montana. Thank you very much. We're going to um, switch out the development teams now and ask the related team if they can come up to the front. They're assembling here. Uh, they're going to switch out their boards, and then first um, we'll have uh, Bill Woody, who's the president of Related California, speak. Thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome. Um, I first have to say that I first appeared before you six months ago when you approved an exclusive negotiating agreement for us and at the time. Um, you know, we were very excited. We had a vision. We had 230 acres to work with. We had a lot to learn. Um, you have made us feel incredibly comfortable here. Um, I know that sounds like a general comment, but when you're taking on something of this magnitude, it's really important to feel that at the community level, at the council level, at the staff level, that people are supportive in general, not of a specific plan, but that they share the vision. In fact, in many respects, it was your vision. Um, and I think that's colored our very positive experience in those six months. With me tonight are Steve Eimer, who you will hear from, who will go through our plans, our project executive. Uh, who has a lifetime career of managing high-density, complicated mixed-use projects. We sometimes check his sanity, but he's been doing it for a long time. <laughs> My partner, Roger Torriero, who actually got us involved to begin with. And Nate Cherry, partner with RTKL Architects, who's been our master planner. Also here is Lydia Tan, the head of our Northern California office. Well, in that six months, we've gotten a lot smarter. We, on a technical level, and we have a lot to deal with here, we've had several meetings with the state and county regulators who oversee the development on any landfill site. The uh, city has been with us in those meetings. We feel we've gotten a very good handle on the parameters for development, 
on the cost of development, how to create the infrastructure, and working with architects and engineers in that regard. And I will say that while there are challenges, the regulators are very enthusiastic about commercial development occurring on landfill. They would strongly prefer this for a whole range of reasons. We're still working with them on the possibility of residential development on landfill to have an even bigger mix of abuses. And the economic side, we've completed very detailed market studies for all the potential uses we are considering, most notably retail, food and beverage and entertainment, um, residential, office, and hotel. And all of them, particularly on the retail side, have come in stronger than we might have anticipated. You know, you get these, you're a developer, you get these studies, you need them for lenders and investors. You get them, you say, gee, I wish it were better. If you go back to the consultant, can't we do a little better? This time, it came back better than we anticipated. That doesn't happen very often. So another good thing. We've begun a series of community outreach meetings on a very informal basis because, as everybody, all the speakers have said, this is a first cut. This isn't the end game. This is where we start. We take very seriously engagement uh, with the community. Um, we have, as Kurt said, we've had a series of meetings both with staff and with the Montana Whittick Low team. We will continue to do that to ensure that both of these projects are successful. I really believe we can help each other and that the whole will be greater than the sum of the parts. Um, now, looking at 230 acres, you know, you don't do all of this all at once. So we were guided in the plan that Steve will present to you in a minute by, I think, three or four key objectives. The first is to create a true city center. Not a town center, but a city center. Because, as Joe and Kurt and others have said, I mean, this is more than just a nice little village. This is a place for the city and perhaps even larger, where all type, all people from all walks of life can gather. The second is the flexibility across all 230 acres to respond to changing market conditions, changing economic conditions, and changing city policies. As we go through this process with you, some of the many issues, some of which you've heard about from the public tonight, will evolve and there will be opportunities. And we try to do this in such a way that we can respond to those opportunities. Certainly it involves the convention center. It involves other, I'll call it entertainment, public uses. There's the room to do that. We don't see this as developers. We don't get this opportunity. We want to make sure we get it right. To anticipate traffic flows and infrastructure needs. I mean, this is kind of the blocking and tackling of development. You know, the stuff that isn't sexy, but with such a large site and with these site parameters comes a lot of challenges. We've tried to work very, very closely with Julio and his staff, uh, with Kevin and Ruth and the Public Works people. Um, in fact, they're probably sick of us by now. But it's going to be very important to continue those relationships as we go along. So with that, let me turn it over to Steve, who will walk you through um, walk you through our plan. Hardest part of the evening will be figuring it out. It's a little too loud.
and then back along the boundaries of um, the Irvine Gateway, uh, back down to Great America Parkway, and then along the Thomas Plants uh, uh, Creek area adjacent to the Convention Center. Uh, the ENA area encompassed the 230 acres in total, and, and in our thinking and planning, we've actually excluded uh, from our planning the retention pond, detention pond area, 15 acres of our northeastern end. Uh, they're we divide the site into roughly four uh, parcels, which you can see indicated here, and these areas roughly conform to the to the locations of the individual landfill uh, trash dump sites that uh, have been operated on the site. They go back all the way to the 1930s, actually, in our historic research. Um, as Bill mentioned, uh, five and a half months of very detailed review and analysis of uh, all of the various site opportunities and constraints. Um, I'm going to spare you uh, all the gory details, uh, particularly those related to the landfill issues. Uh, and just uh, suffice it to say that uh, the site, even with all of this challenges, uh, we do believe uh, is developable for much higher and better uses than, than currently exist. Uh, all of our work uh, to date across the board uh, has really informed our decision to go forward with the project. And uh, it, it, it has also formed the basis of, um, of the conceptual land use plan that we're presenting tonight. Uh, this is our conceptual land use plan. Um, this mass planning effort uh, has been guided uh, as Bill mentioned, by the world-renowned uh, architectural design master planning firm of RTKL, represented tonight by Mr. Nate Cherry, uh, who I've, I've had the pleasure of working with off and on for about 35 years. I think. Nate, he's not that old, but I am. Um, <laughs> this effort really represents a, a comprehensive approach to master planning the entire site. Um, and. Um, with uh, synergistic uses, uses that, that can sustain themselves by themselves, but also add to each other uh, in a very synergistic fashion. The heart and soul of, of our project is really our city center located in this area where all the multiple colors form uh, this is a new city center for Santa Clara. It's a true mixed-use environment. Uh, live, live, work, play at a very human scale. Um, one interesting thing I know is that, and we're never far away from the <laughs> landfill and landfill issues on the site, but our development plan will incorporate in the city center area the development of, a, of an entire platform above the landfill. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting approach and it's an important approach because the quality of the environment that we want to build here with landscaping and public spaces and streets and, and, and sidewalks um, you, you just cannot deal with the issue of differential settlement that has plagued a number of other landfill projects in the Bay Area. and so. We're going to build that platform, and then all of the structures uh, get built about it. Um, one of the key issues for us, and it's been touched on, is really uh, the effective and, and grand access requirements that we will need, uh, both from Tasman here in conjunction with the uh, entrance to the Montana Low properties, and also here at Great America. Uh, these are the only two entrance points that we have available to us to service our city center. Uh, because as you know, Lafayette uh, on the west side uh, has the uh, rail line. 
uh, and also some very substantial power lines, which prevent uh, basically access. We're hoping to get a bridge uh, structure across um, Lafayette at some point. But those two access points at Tasman and at Great America uh, are really critical uh, to our project. Um, we, in that, not only for automobile access, but we also feel very strongly that pedestrian flow uh, here at Tasman and Centennial and other pedestrian access points in this area are really important to work both directions, from the stadium traffic and from our project back to the Montana Low properties as well as to the stadium. There's got to be a porosity and flow of pedestrian traffic in that zone. Uh, I'm going to uh, spend a few more minutes in just a minute on, on the city center, but I'd like to walk you through just quickly a few of the other elements of the, of the plan. Um, one of the important, in moving in, in this zone, which we're envisioning as primarily an, an office uh, park configuration, which obviously has a direct relationship to a city center, but it also has a built-in connectivity uh, to your convention center, tech mart, and, and hotels. And there are some interesting opportunities, we think, uh, for working together with the city to maybe even enhance your activities here at the convention center and hotel with what we can do in, the, in this zone of the, of the project. Um, moving on north, uh, as you can see, uh, the, the plan really hinges on a lot of connectivity throughout the project, and that's for um, automobile connectivity, vehicular, bike uh, connectivity, walking paths, uh, and that's extremely important as the project uh, emerges to tie all of these uses essentially back to the city center. That's our goal. Uh, this area of the property uh, overlooking, in essence, the Irvine Gateway property because it's at such a high elevation with freeway visibility on both of these parcels we're envisioning as corporate office development of various types of uh, pro property and uh, as well as this would be envisioned as uh, yet another corporate office uh, opportunity. Uh, in this area uh, we envision a retail center being developed uh, of about 400,000 square feet uh, this will allow us to provide a very broad offering, a little bit higher end uh, shops and restaurants and facilities in our city center, and uh, this will be um, uh, oriented more toward um, a mid-price mid uh, store and retail configurations. Again, connectivity is really a, a tremendous goal of our planning. <coughs> this would connect in to whatever the future uses uh, on the Tasman East property might emerge. This is um, just a very overall compilation of our square footage um, and distribution by parcel and also the FARs that we're envisioning as part of the project. And as you can see, in this scheme, um, we're envisioning about four and a half million square feet of development, and as I'll explain in the next slide, we also have some ideas about the uh, project in, in very positive ways. Uh, and at that uh, uh, square footage, with our acreage, uh, that would produce an overall FAR of 0.44. Uh, it ranges within the project of uh, up to about 0.77 FAR in parcel 4, which is our city center, as you would expect. Uh, mid-rise uh, buildings, a uh, bit more density, uh, down to the retail center about uh, 0.19. Uh, this is a, a little bit finer look at um, our square footage allocations among the various uses throughout the entire project. Uh, first item is residential. Uh, which we're envisioning to be located basically uh, in the area between the Mon Montana Low properties and our city center, but become very much a part of that city center experience. We're envisioning uh, somewhere in the range of about 530 uh, units, 
they are podium style to be built above both base level retail and in parking. Um, the next major uh, category of use is commercial, <coughs> and that includes uh, both our city center uses as well as uh, our retail center. Um, and uh, office uses, which actually represents, because of the distribution, a fairly large part of our overall square footage. Uh, we're anticipating about 2.2 million square feet of office development, ultimately in phases over time. <coughs> Uh, and also a hotel uh, of about 200 rooms, which would be located, again, uh, as an integral part of our city center. Uh, I mentioned the notion of densification of the site, and we have, uh, in each of our office areas and also in the city center, we, we think we have an opportunity to increase height and increase the number of buildings by adding structured parking over time. And uh, if we did that, um, that would produce potentially another 800,000 square feet and would get us up to a total uh, then of about uh, 5,247,000 square feet across the project. Uh, in addition, these are our uh, estimated parking counts. And in doing this, uh, we have really taken account, we believe, of, of what, what the real parking demand uh, will be. And uh, because we want to be able to satisfy the real parking demand for our customers, clients, et cetera, not just uh, an artificial uh, level of demand. And that would get us up uh, to about 14,000 spaces uh, against the 4 million square feet of development or uh, close to 16,000 spaces if we went up to the full 5 million two. I want to just step back uh, quickly to the city center for a minute and just walk you through uh, our program. Um, city center is um, envisioned to be uh, anchored <coughs> with potential three parking stores. Um, and that anchoring will then allow us to uh, tenant the facility, bring in a variety of users, special shops, restaurants, and entertainment. Uh, venues. Uh, on, in the plan, you'll see depicted this large block of space, department store. Large block of space, department store. Linked very, very carefully uh, in the in integrated fully into the landscape and the streetscape. A third department store may go just flanking our our central our center park uh, at this location. And this is a fairly traditional uh, layout uh, of an anchoring of a department store scheme that really provides the basis for a substantial amount of uh, further retail food and beverage and mixed use. As you can see, um, in our city center, we are looking at the potential of a total of almost a million five in square footage which is broken out by close to a million square feet in commercial uses, some office, and a, and a hotel integrated uh, directly in. When I mentioned the, the uh, densification, here's an example. We've identified a couple of sites here in the city center where, in fact, we may be able to, depending on market conditions and what the landfill regulatory agencies tell us, we may be able to incorporate uh, some mid-rise uh, residential over retail in those locations. Uh, one quick uh, mention of an alternative that we, we have put in the plan at this point for further discussion is in the event that, <coughs> that, that we did not pursue the retail center on parcel two, uh, we do believe that, that potentially that we could incorporate an additional uh, office in that location. <coughs> and that's just a, a depiction of how that might lay out um, this is an overall view of our city center. It's our vision, looking north from um, Levi Stadium. Um, I would point out a few important features. Uh, this is our center park, uh, which will which would be a heavily landscaped, heavily used uh, park, fully integrated, 
at street level into the surrounding retail, food, beverage, and entertainment uh, uses. Um, it's really important to highlight our view of the, the development of these blocks uh, at a human scale, a continuous streetscape throughout the entire project uh, in the city center, uh, which allows for uh, incorporation of high quality shopping, uh, dining, entertainment, and, and services. You'll note, uh, even in this sketch or diagram, uh, very varied building heights, uh, which we think is important to help accentuate uh, an urban feel for the city center. Uh, you'll also see uh, in the project a uh, varied architecture, all of high quality uh, within project design guidelines that will be established uh, up front. Uh, this will help uh, provide an, an enhanced visual uh, appeal to the entire project. The architecture, we're thinking more along the contemporary lines, uh, which we think speaks to the bright future of, of Santa Clara uh, and Silicon Valley. Uh, throughout the project, uh, we'll see lush landscaping, um, which helps to create an urban oasis in a digital world. I'd also emphasize to you that Related has a very, very strong firm-wide commitment to environmentally sensitive design and, and building operation. Um, and we will, uh, with this project, uh, exceed the highest levels of, of lead certification for everything we do here. <coughs> a bit closer in view of, uh, of our city center, this is a view looking from the north to the south, you can see a representation of the stadium, the corner, again, the center park, a relationship of department store, cinema, food and beverage, restaurants, first level, second level, department store, very walkable, pedestrian friendly, parking garages that are tucked behind the uses uh, throughout and wrapped by lively pedestrian-oriented uses throughout. Uh, this, is, this is all about placemaking, and, and really what it is, it's a place for you and yours to, to come frequently, every day, every night, and not just special days. It's truly a, a live, work, play environment. And uh, we, we look forward to working closely with the city uh, to make this dream a reality. And uh, Bill's got a couple of closing ones. Thank you, Steve. Just a couple of comments. Um, the downtowns, in the traditional sense, the traditional downtown that everybody evokes today, and as Kurt, Kurt alluded to, people want these mixed-use environments. Those downtowns were places where people of all ages, all walks of life, would come together. They would shop, eat, and frankly, simply hang out. That's what's missing in a lot of these communities. That's what we think, collectively together, we can create here. Um, the project also, as Steve alluded to, like in all of our mixed-use properties, ultimately we believe the public spaces will be as important as the private spaces. We're not Chicago or New York. We have weather in California. Um, it's all about indoor-outdoor experience. Some of it is shopping, some of it is entertainment, and some of it is just hanging out. It's mixing people of all ages, you know, all coming together. That's what we think can be accomplished here. Frankly, we'd like to see a little more residential, if we can, if we can get through, in a mixed-use setting. Um, history has shown recently here that those kinds of uses get real premiums. People will pay more to live in a mixed-use setting. I think it can really work here. Lastly, let me say that there are elements of Santana Row here. There are elements of other developments both of these developments 
But this is its own development. This is a Santa Clara development. And the things that make these special is when they're not off the shelf. They're created specifically for a place and specifically for a community. And that's what we hope to do here. We look forward to the next round of community outreach. Uh, there's going to be a lot of it. You're going to see a lot of us here over the next months and uh, hopefully years. Uh, you know, and we hope to learn more. I mean, we've already expanded our repertoire, our limited repertoire of restaurants and coffee shops. We have a little more work to do in that regard. Um, so with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Whitty. What a, a wonderful presentation and, and a great thoughtful one, uh, as expected from a, the related. So we'll go down and start with council members. Council member Davis. Uh, Bill, I just wanted to ask you a question um, in relationship to both projects. The hotels are a big factor in the vision that I have seen. I, I really appreciate the fact that you want to add on to our convention center. That's extremely important. Uh, San Jose has already taken care of theirs. And I guess I'm a little greedy. I want to keep the money in Santa Clara. So I think you and um, Joe had said that you're adding on maybe 425 rooms. Is there any way we could give some more thought to hotel rooms on both projects in partnership with Joe? There's always a way. Um, one of the things I think Steve pointed out is that segment to the western edge of the city center closer to the con a convention center. And we've programmed it just nominally now as potential office. But I know we've talked to the chamber and others at the convention center that you know maybe in conjunction with a convention center expansion that something can be done. There's connectivity potential there, um, so it's certainly something that we could explore. Okay, I would really like if you, if you could think about that. Just going forward, um, maybe if there's more input coming from the stakeholders that are in the city of Santa Clara, they might appreciate that. Um, I, I see us developing large, um, I see not one Super Bowl, but a few Super Bowls. And if we have the hotels here, you know, we build a stadium, they will come. And they're coming. So I really want to make sure that they have, will experience this center, will want to stay, you know, at the restaurants or, and visit the other areas. We have, the, you know, the music park, we have a lot of different things. I want to make it the destination that it should be. So I'm just asking if you could just take a look at that. We certainly, okay. We've seen in downtown LA where we're active, how uh, there's for different reasons a similar move to expand and grow the convention center, and it's heavily about adding hotel rooms, which you know they're trying hard to do. Councilmember Gilmer. Thank you. Um, okay, <clears throat> those green patches on top of the buildings there, I know we're looking for soccer fields in Santa Clara. <laughs> <laughs> Before I, I give my comments, I just wanted to um, point out someone uh, that has very, been very instrumental to this project, and his name is John Elwood. He's over there in the corner, John, would you raise your hand, please? Um, if it wasn't for John bringing this project and uh, introducing us to Roger Torriero, who then brought in Bill and his very professional related team, um, John's wisdom, foresight, and vision, we wouldn't be here today. So thank you very much, John. I do want it to go unnoticed that you brought this project uh, to us. Um, <clears throat> this is everything we talk about when we campaign for Measure J in the stadium. Uh, although this by far exceeds anything I could have imagined um, around the stadium. So I think it's a wonderful project. I know that we are, uh, both the council and the community are going to have a chance to dig into all the various um, sections of the project. I too would like to see more residential on this project. I know that a complaint that we've had from our workforce is that there's really not enough places for people to live, and if they live here, there's not enough for them to do to keep them here. There's a much younger generation out there that is working in Silicon Valley that uh, they'll work here, but then they'll go home to San Francisco or other places that they feel there's uh, more entertainment, restaurants, nightlife, other things for them to do. 
So this will be a place for our workforce uh, to live and play and um, uh, a work. So it's a place that our residents in Santa Clara, I really like the contemporary feel of it, um, a place to, uh, to come hang out with your family. This even excited a 17 year old that doesn't get excited about anything. I told him that, look, well, I'll so really, when's this happening? I said, well, you'll be about 25 when it's finished. And other than that, he says, I'm coming back home, Mom. So um, we're working on our traditional downtown in near Santa Clara University in the Franklin Mall area in Santa Clara. But this is a wonderful alternative for not just our residents, but on a regional basis. And this will really help us generate income uh, to our general fund to help us really increase our services in Santa Clara. So this is going to help us in our future, and I look forward to digging into the details and making it work. But thank you very much for your very professional team, how you've approached us, and taking a project and this property that is extremely challenging, extremely to say the least. But thank you very much. Great. Additional comments from council members? Council Member Mann? A couple questions. Um, how is it that you envision Centennial Boulevard going into your project? You know, in terms of articulating with the property in front, I mean, is it wider? I mean, what's your vision? And then a second question. Well, go ahead. well, I think as, as has been commented already, um, it's got to serve both projects. It's got to work for the Montana Whitted Low project, and it's got to work for the larger project. And as Kurt said, I think we've made progress um, in that direction. Um, it's mainly having clear sight lines, as Steve said, working both vehicular and pedestrian. You know, quite frankly, a traffic engineer may have more to say about this than either of the two teams, ultimately, as they assess, you know, potential traffic demand, et cetera. And uh, Kurt also mentioned the, the leveling off of Centennial, so there, there's not a dip. So you have, you have a coherent town. You've got two projects, but you've got a coherent city center. And has anyone done any drawings or, or renditions that would show both projects you know, on the same page, so to speak? I know this rendition shows a little bit as you look south toward the Tasman, but I, I'm trying to get some visualization as to how the two projects would look vis-a-vis -vis each other so that you can sort of make that judgment. Well, that's part of the process that uh, we still need to go through. At this point, we're showing site plans that are uh, further along in terms of their elevations, but as it relates to the other project, we need to get um, the elevations for that project and try to interrelate inter uh, them together. So basically, we'll get a good uh, first view of how this will look uh, overall. Uh, we plan to do that in the next round of, uh, of review. Uh, and, um, and I think at that point we can start getting into much more detail so that we can uh, start getting some questions answered on, on some of the details so that we can eventually get them out to uh, a situation where they could uh, start to prepare their application to the board and get the same process underway. Also, we need to get the site plans uh, vetted very well because those are really going to be the beginning of the development of the term sheets. And the term sheets will eventually uh, uh, end up in a development agreement, and we have to start working on that as well because uh, there is public land involved here, and uh, we have to go through that entire process. So, yes. So, being that this is the first rollout, um, do we have a timeline for the second rollout? I mean, if there's, you know, some support that we need to put around the stadium for the synergy, um, I understand we're trying to get this done, but do we have a timeline in any? Uh, in terms of when development may take place. Well, that's the other another issue that we have to come back and show you, and that would be the performance schedule on when this, uh, this process can take place, what the milestones are within the performance schedule, and those milestones will lead to the actual uh, construction. And we will have that uh, available for you at your, your next session. So that will be the second rollout? Yes. Okay. I have one more question. This is for staff. Um, do we need to have the applications in play before the city can go out and start a CEQA process? I mean, can we just kind of do a master plan CEQA based on what we anticipate will be coming in? Yeah, 
yeah, we can start a program level uh, environmental document really um, at, at any time um, that's going to evolve, of course, but uh, our, our goal is to start a, a wider level SQL work and then drill down as, as necessary. Will that shorten the, the uh, process for the applicants somewhat? Mm -hmm. yes. Getting started earlier will result in being finished earlier, of course, yeah, but otherwise it. probably not. <laughs> The SQL is what it is. Uh, you know, it could take a uh, uh, minimum of 12 months. It could take as long as a year and a half. I mean, we have to go through the process. We can't uh, do any kind of shortcuts. Especially with the law solutions. Do we have some additional comments or questions? Um, one of the issues I, that, of course, I was uh, struck with was the issues of circulation and looks like you've been very thoughtful on the circulation with uh, what you have to work with currently. Um, has there been much thought about uh, creating a, a, a ramp into the development off of, say, the path and overpass? Because there's certainly looks like an opportunity. You've created a backbone, uh, a backbone uh, circulation off of it uh, to continue anyway. So I was just wondering whether or not that had been considered as, as provide additional level of access. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we looked at several different ways to increase access and, uh, and work with the Montana team uh, in evaluating some of those issues. There's more work to be done on that. Uh, we think that there is a way at the eastern end uh, to get additional access both on the south side by way of a slip ramp and potentially on the north side uh, similar way. Also on the western end Adjacent to the city parking garage, we also think that that's another good place, and, and I think we're all on board with that notion of a of a ramping system uh, that would help allow access to and from on the western end. That's an extremely important point because tremendous traffic, obviously, uh, needs to be dispersed, and, and obviously the light rail is a great great enhancement uh, to that issue for us as well. We're really happy to see that. We're going to work closely with the BTA to maximize that. Thank you very much. Is there any additional questions or comments? Mr. Marcelli? I just want to make the comment of, first of all, thanking uh, Bill and the related team and also Joe Montana and his team. I think it's a very outstanding, the two projects together are very outstanding, very mm -hmm. exciting. And what the, econ you know, the economic development and the future of our city that these two pro projects bring is just uh, unbelievable. Uh, never envisioned uh, uh, seeing this coming to our city, and, and it's just uh, again a very outstanding opportunity for our city. But I think it would be remiss if I don't thank our city staff, <clears throat> because I know they've done an outstanding job in working with our two potential development partners here because this is truly a team effort and again I just want to make sure that our staff does not go unrecognized for the outstanding job you guys have done. Thank you. Very nice council member Marcelli. I'm sure I put by every council member here. Um, so moving to city staff or professional staff, um, we talked a little bit about the for our development what would need to happen. What are the next steps for the public? At what point would we come back with a more refined vision? How would that work so we can ensure that everyone can stay plugged in? Well, what I'd like to do at this point, Mr. Mayor, if it would be all right, would be to introduce uh, Frank Fuller, uh, the architect that we have brought on board to help us with this. And I'd like to give you a, kind of a, a quick overview of some of the issues that we're, that we're going to have to address. And then we can uh, give you at least maybe a, an overview of what the next steps are after Frank makes his presentation. Thank you, Manager Funded. Welcome, Mr. Fuller. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor members of the City Council, everyone assembled. This project, uh, which I've been hired as the principal of Field Colonial Architects to help with, is a really exciting project. There are very few places where you have this kind of site, this kind of enthusiasm, and the amazing talent of both the development teams and the city staff. We've done a series of almost a half a dozen meetings with all the teams to come up with the coordination of these uh, proposals. Now that's not easy because everyone has a lot of interests in what will occur. So what we did is to come up with a series of design principles in very brief form 
that everyone could then look to, at least from the design point of view. And to just summarize them quickly for you, the first one, because this also is a unique project in that the city owns most of the land. And as some of the commentators <laughs> said in the beginning part of the meeting, the public uh, access and the public good for the, a project such as this, which will last for decades and decades, which is a new t a city center, as you've heard, uh, being built within Santa Clara, means that the first set of principles we talked about was urban character and identity. You've heard how Centennial and Tasman really need to be signature boulevards. That was the first part. They need to be uh, something that announces and is a real gateway for the project. <coughs> they need to have the views as you come in on Tasman and as you look up Centennial. And we heard that referred to in various ways. This is going to be experienced uh, at night, in the evening. All the signage, all the graphics, all the branding needs to be coordinated so that you understand this is Santa Clara. This is not necessarily related or Montana Wittick Low. It's Santa Clara. And so that and how that fits together with the whole project is important. We specified that the sidewalks along Centennial and along Tasman need to be at least 30 feet wide. They need to be wide because at the events, as well as in other times, everyone needs to be able to get there from heavy rail, light rail, across the streets, and from the convention center, as we've also heard. So with, with those two streets, wide sidewalks, even with the other streets, they have generous sidewalks. The next one had to do with access and circulation, and we've heard a lot about that, too, because as was pointed out, for the whole over 230 acres, there are only two major ways off of Tasman and off of uh, the north-south street. And so to make sure that you really have the adequate access, we ask for three ways to get in between the creek and the railroad and, and Lafayette on Tasman. That means that Centennial is one of them. There need to be two more. This is a very, actually, constrained site because of some of the uh, conditions that occur at that large site. So we put one near the garage on the west side, the city garage. We recommended one uh, to be uh, at least at Stars and Stripes in some way. That's much more difficult. We talked about maybe having a ramp off of the top where it crosses the railroad. Maybe there's another way of slip ramps. Maybe there's other ways. These are things that really need to be studied because as was said over and over, this is the early days. We, these are conceptual plans still, and this is major, it needs to be considered in all its uh, aspects. The third part of five was the development patterns. If this is going to be a place where you really can walk and walk easily, the blocks can't be huge. They need to be, we said, maybe 300 by 400 feet uh, on any dimension. What that means is that it only takes a couple of minutes to walk a block. And then you even, in a lot of places, you can walk through the blocks. That's very important to the, the way that this is configured so that people have lots of choices and can actually walk around. Secondly, that the blocks on the east end of the sites, there's a big curve there where Stars and Stripes curves near the fire station coming to the railroad station. Let's square that off. I don't think it needs to be quite that round. So we can actually get better access and nice walkable blocks. We, we heard about the topography. The topography of the site, it goes up and down about 20 feet. We need to make sure that as you come into the city garage, as you come in on Centennial, as you're down to the railroad station, that the, that's looked at and considered, particularly along Stars and Stripes. It will also affect the infrastructure, but that topography not only makes it a success for how the retailing and everyone works as they walk around from the stadium or back and forth in the project, but that it um, works for all the servicing and all the parts that, that are the back of the house that need to work as well. The bridge over the streets. Now, we'll have a lot of discussion, I think, about that, the dis whether there's a bridge across Centennial or not. And there are differences of opinions, and there will be a lot of discussions about a lot of these issues of whether it what it does for the views, what it does for the success of each project. 
that's uh, a, 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 I think that's going to be an issue we'll all be talking about as we keep for the next rollout, and it's a part of everyone's view of what how we get total success for all the projects. The fourth area was land use and parking. It's really important, as we've heard tonight, there's a lot of retail, a lot of hotels, a lot of different uses that need to be coordinated in how they're leased, how, what kind of, of, of retail is on the Montana with a low property, what kind of retail is in the related property, how they're coordinated in terms of a leasing strategy. It'll be very important to the overall success of both projects and how it works for Santa Clara's new city center. The parking, we've heard a lot about how much parking, where it is, how it is, how much you see it, how much you don't, whether it blocks ways that you can get from one place to another, all very important. And the summary of the parking provided, how much, and then how much can it be used by other uses for different events, as well as how much is dedicated for the certain uses is something we're really looking at very carefully. So in the future, and part of the CEQA process, will be traffic, mobility, parking, even more. And so we're still in the early days. It's very exciting. We're really glad to be able to be working together with such talent and uh, glad to have uh, heard such enthusiasm tonight. Thank you. Just to follow up on your question, earlier question, um, I think we'll need at least another session or two, depending on the, um, how much the detail the council wants to uh, uh, dive into the, uh, the detail of development. But we need to finalize site plans, elevations. Uh, we need to uh, agree that the use categories are what the council wants to see. Uh, because all of those elements will lead to the, uh, the key terms and the underlying assumptions for the term sheet. We'd like to have the term sheets uh, completed in early 2014. Uh, when we have that uh, established, uh, they can begin to initiate the CEQA process. We can work with their, uh, with their companies that they hired to uh, put them through CEQA. As part of CEQA, we'll do community outreach. Uh, how that will occur, that will be established as we get into the CEQA process. Uh, we'll also have to begin work on the ground lease because uh, we, uh, we own the property and we will continue to retain the property. Uh, and that ground lease, uh, along with all the other assumptions, will uh, end up uh, in a development agreement. Once we get through CEQA, once we get the ground lease uh, completed, all the underlying assumptions are done, we'll then start the entitlements. And, and Kevin and his uh, partner will uh, continue to work on the entitlements. Uh, and once the entitlements are completed, I'm assuming at that point, or maybe sooner, the companies will start on their construction drawings. And, uh, and we will continue to work with them. One of the things we've talked about doing is to hire uh, companies uh, that would be solely devoted to working with them at, um, at reviewing construction drawings and, and dealing with all of the other entitlement issues. Uh, Kevin has uh, had that conversation about when we present some people on board that can help. I think it would be wise because these projects are very big and, uh, and they certainly have <coughs> the attention. So, See, we still have quite a bit of work to do, and uh, we'd love to get to a uh, permit and get it underway, but, but unfortunately we have to go through all these steps. So, anyway, but we'll try to get them through as quickly as possible. <coughs> we realize time is money. Fantastic. Well, we've heard that before. It'll take a long time, and somehow things get done. Here. <laughs> uh, are the council up to any additional questions for staff? Well, thank you very much. This was a, a wonderful presentation. It shows the teamwork and collaboration. The first the start of the conversation that's going to last for quite a while. I know there will be a, a lot of challenges and changes and opportunities, uh, but we're excited about seeing it roll out and uh, the potential that it can be. So with that, we'll go ahead and take 15 minutes and, and then we can <laughs>
the agreement that would allow the uh, 49ers to use the uh, uh, golf course for parking uh, during game days. And uh, I'm going to let Alan kind of walk us through it, give us a quick update. And I will say that we, we, we have seen a draft agreement. Uh, we went over that today. Uh, we're still working on language, but uh, we will have something shortly to present to the city council and community on the issue. But how do you want to walk us through so it's not dangerous? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So, um, I'm interesting to follow Joe on hand. I don't expect that to perfectly. Let's talk about the golf course on an um, interim basis. Um, as you're aware, the golf course is currently lo located uh, across the street. Uh, from the stadium, uh, has um, it, It's a great course, um, 72, par 72. Um, we, this is an update to what the presentation we gave you back in September. So we have had our uh, police staff go down to go the Rose Bowl and look at some of their events and how they lay it out and the public safety components and how they really work. So, um, the, the main uh, item I would like to go through today is kind of a layout of the areas. So we've just worked with the team and consultants from the Rose Bowl to really adapt their best practices and bring them back to Santa Clara. Um, so let me just kind of go through that right now. Here's some photos that were recently taken by our public safety staff of the Rose Bowl parking. This was a uh, 75,000 um, uh, person event. It was a game between uh, UCLA and the Leeds at Cal Bears. Um, so they really designate the two 18 hole uh, golf courses for parking. They do a great job in the 70s. You can see in the upper uh, photo there, they're really protecting the greens and the tees to make sure it's playable for golf for the very next day. In fact, the day of the event, they are still playing for a night game when they're on the course in the morning. So uh, a lot of lessons learned there. Um, parking on the fairways, really separating some of these parking areas. It's really not crowded, it's a great event. People throwing frisbees, throwing footballs, families out there. It's, it's a, a really a positive aspect. Uh, there's a lot of hospitality, concession areas. I'm showing you uh, one slide on, on the bottom corner. They actually have balloons that designate areas where there's food, where the parking area is. So if you're parking on a certain parking lot, they actually have a balloon that's there. You can be, be matching that system. It seems to work very well. So here's the detailed layout that we worked out with the team. Again, a lot of effort was working with American Golf to establish pathways that would to build upon the existing car paths. Uh, we'd be uh, really recognizing those to, for, for uh, passenger vehicles. And then we would have some, frankly, um, I wouldn't say cut-throughs, but uh, trying to expand the connectivity between the holes to allow for parking because, again, um, we want to get closer to paths and that's the closest location to the golf course. So looking at it, we really narrowed our, our, our look at uh, what, the east, what we call the east of Lafayette and the west of Lafayette. So what we call the Mesa holes, I think six and seven, which are more elevated. We don't see those as really viable at this time. It's, it's not the high hit to walk. Uh, so these are the primary locations we're looking at. And the folks that would go on the east of Lafayette site, there's an existing pedestrian bridge that used for the golfing course right now. Perfectly acceptable for pedestrian traffic. So uh, this is an update actually to what I provided uh, back in September. And we've been checking the box. Um, uh, the team, uh, as, as city manager mentioned, has agreed to, to upfront all the costs, the capital costs, current costs associated with parking on the golf course. Um, we also have worked with American Golf to figure out what type of impacts there would be if we would have parking on the golf course in terms of their revenues, because we want to make sure those revenues go back to the general fund, that, that we don't see a reduction there. Uh, that uh, this plan works as well with TMOB and our sequel. So as you are aware, uh, TMOB is our transportation management operations plan. And that plan looks at all the intricacies of how we move people in and outside uh, the stadium. And, and you know, there's still 68,500 seats in there. And it's just trying to get that traffic out of your work. And then, uh, of course, in, in relation to the related Montana uh, developments. We don't want any parking rights agreement with uh, Mexico or, or the stadium authority that affects those developments because we want those to move kind of as quickly forward as possible. And then finally, we finally want to address the, uh, the convention center parking issue working with the team, so we'll be bringing something back to council on that. Um, so we're looking on the, we just had a meeting today with uh, uh, the county 
terms of the landfill versus coast closure plan, what would that look like, how we will amend that plan. And then our goal is to bring this back all wrapped up in a nice bow November 19th. It's very aggressive. Uh, but we want to get this, this, this parking relief that's done. Uh, really the goal is trying to get these parking passes to pre-sell the site uh, in, in the December time frame. So we're, we're being very aggressive over the next month. Did want to highlight a little bit on the total parking objective um, because I think we've had a lot of, of, of uh, information going out there and I just wanted to clarify. So uh, we are looking uh, for the same parking needs uh, and the team is taking the lead on that. They need 21,000 stops. Uh, so they have executed contracts today for 11,000. They're real close with some right now on five and they have other businesses that they're targeting selectively. Uh, with another 4,000 spaces. So on top of that, you know, we're looking at this golf course parking. And we don't want to overpark it, but we think the right, the right number is around 5,000 uh, vehicles for that golf course. So that brings us to really targeting 25,000. Do we need 25,000 spaces? No, we need 21,000 spaces. But this traditional parking allows us flexibility to park maybe on the golf course in some events, and maybe other places other times. So if there is an event, say, at Great America, we still have enough parking spaces to have an event in Great America, keep them open, and have a really nice event at the stadium. So that's really the request of the And that uh, concludes my presentation. Here's some questions. So. Mr. Mayor, one point I want to add to Alan's presentation. If you look at his schedule there, uh, 5,000 uh, spaces are attributed to the golf course. Uh, one of the things as we bring back uh, further information regarding those developments, um, I think uh, as time goes on, we're going to have to really nail down uh, the construction phase of the latest project. Uh, if they build in phases, which uh, we've anticipated all along, uh, that would, I think, uh, the phasing approach would allow us to maintain a good portion of those 5,000 parking spaces uh, somewhere on, on the property. Uh, if they approach it in one uh, one phase of development, uh, then we'll probably end up losing those spaces. But uh, but I, I really think that overall, at least from what Bill has told us and what I read in the paper recently, is that they probably will approach it in a phased approach. So we'll, we'll monitor that and we'll keep you and the council members in the loop uh, for any changes. Also, um, Council uh, Woman O'Neill wanted us to uh, provide uh, a rollout on the TMOC. We will do that on uh, November uh, 16th. Is it 16th? Council uh, Yes, Council Or 19th, excuse me, I'm sorry. The dates are all crossed. November 19th, we'll roll it out and uh, we'll do a big uh, display on, on the TMOC and show everyone how it, how it works and give you an update on that. Okay, okay do we have some questions for the event here on this item? Um, I was just wondering that it looks like the, what we're trying to do is we're trying not to penetrate the cap by having temporary lights out there to keep everything subserviced. Um, so that, that's a great thing. I, I, that works out really well. There was original discussion about the driving range um, because there's a big culvert that's really off the toe of the old uh, landfill. Is, does that include the driving, filling the driving range area? Um, so right, right now the driving range, as you're correct, is like a two-tier type of driving range. Um, so they'll be parking at the higher level, but not the lower level. That lower level is actually used uh, for our stormwater mm -hmm. pump station. So it's, it's actually a little level basin out there. So we'll be parking at the upper level, but, but not the lower level. Okay, and of course, uh, it's any obvious, but uh, that was the thing I pointed out I was concerned about the, the timing of it in terms of the contract that locks us up to prevent the development. Is there any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So we'll just move through the agenda. That's what that's okay. So moving down to um, the next item, which is the presentation on exploring partnership opportunities with the International Swim Hall of Fame, International Swim Center. That's right, but that race director will uh, make sure the patients are there. Welcome, Director Pixie Arms. Thank you, Mr. Good evening. Uh, this is a really exciting, uh, I think, exciting item. Uh, as I always talk, so I get paid to be neutral, but I'm just excited. <laughs> Which one, right? Right. All right, just to, uh, for, for everyone's uh, sake, uh, I'm sure you're all aware that Georgia Haynes International Swim Center is actually located uh, right next door to us. And uh, the facility was built in 1966, uh, and since then we've had over uh, 46 
or 46 uh, international Grand Prix and over 28 uh, events, special events, uh, at the Swim Center uh, every year uh, for those 46 years. There's uh, daily use out there. You've got the swim club, you've got the dive club, and you've got the uh, spring and swim aquamates. Uh, it's a heavily used facility. You also have your uh, regular uh, recreation uh, programs, uh, lap swim programs. The Learn to Swim program is also uh, housed there. Uh, the facility, uh, as we all know, uh, is, is kind of constrained, uh, and we are trying to keep it together with uh, bubble gum and, and uh, rubber bands. So uh, you know that the council did uh, take a look uh, in uh, February at a proposal by the Silicon Valley Aquatics Initiative, which is a partnership of all three clubs, uh, to uh, potentially renovate the facility using uh, private dollars. And uh, on September the 10th, uh, you also gave, or back in February, you gave uh, staff the authorization to move forward with a uh, study on the programming and making sure that the uh, that what we do there uh, is uh, is sound from a programmatic standpoint as well as a financial uh, standpoint. The little dotted yellow line you've seen before that's the footprint, the footprint of the existing uh, <coughs> facility. Um, when you look at the Silicon Valley Aquatics Initiative and their uh, original proposal, just so we can see how other uh, opportunities might interface with it. Uh, this is what uh, they have uh, proposed and uh, at this time no changes to that program. This is also uh, one of the programs that we are studying. We looked at, we're looking at the 2008 uh, city design proposal for 60 million. We're looking at the Silicon Valley Aquatics Initiative for 40 and 46 million. And then we're looking at uh, what really do we need to do at this site to make it great and excellent for the next 46 years, meeting both the highest levels of competition as well as your basic community recreation needs, um, as well as uh, perhaps solving uh, any of the uh, other issues that, that might come up along the way. Uh, what's, I think, uh, important uh, that we see uh, is you know, the public process uh, that we're in right now with the sports management group, uh, which will also include uh, public information research both focus groups as well as uh, uh, survey. And we also want to make sure that we address any neighborhood impacts like here to the library or to the events that we have at Central Park as well as to the surrounding neighborhood. So where are we at? Uh, Alan just went me through uh, the last presentation by clicking on what we've actually accomplished since the last time uh, uh, he was talking about the uh, you know, parking on the golf course. Here we have clicking off what we've achieved over the last, uh, since uh, September, uh, with Sports Management Group. So we've done the baseline operational uh, analysis. Uh, we've also, uh, we're benchmarking to five other facilities. And what's important about that is we're a municipal facility. Uh, it's not a private facility, but we have these great partnerships with the nonprofit swim uh, organizations. So we are benchmarking to uh, some facilities in California that actually like uh, Mission Viejo and Irvine, uh, real high level comp uh, competitive and training facilities as well as other municipal uh, facilities within uh, our Northern California markets. Um, and so we're all, all the way down to where we're looking at program menus. You know, what needs to happen in that facility to have it have sound economics and great programming into the future. One of the neat things is I was just going on the web uh, uh, the other day, and I noticed that the uh, Santa Clara Swim Club this November is adding water polo to their complement of programs. I think that's excellent. I was hoping that the study would say, hey, you need to add water polo, but <laughs> swim club's already out there, and they've, they've started doing that. So uh, we are in that program menu uh, phase, so it's, it, it's really an uh, opportune moment for us to come back to council and check in and say, we also have this other opportunity. Um, we're going to get down to the competitive market analysis and, and some of these other things. The conducting private, infor the, private uh, the uh, public information research and input phase, we're thinking that's somewhere in the December, January, perhaps February uh, uh, timeline. And we'd like to be able to take uh, what we uh, uh, gain from council and direction, uh, perhaps plug that into that public information research as well as the program menus, and then come up with uh, 
you know, the actual uh, program for the new facility. So what is this opportunity that we have? And it's actually gotten a lot of traction uh, uh, recently, which is the International Swim Hall of Fame. Uh, they are uh, going to be, uh, their lease expires in Fort Lauderdale, Florida in uh, February of 2015. And some of the indication just in the last week or so is that Fort Lauderdale is saying, well, you know, we tried. Uh, well, we know in Santa Clara, we don't just try, we do. So uh, this is, again, an opportune moment to take a look and say, should we return or bring, not what I'm saying return, but bring the Swimming Hall of Fame to where we have the most Olympic uh, uh, swim medals, where we have a stellar um, swim club, dive club, aquamates, and where we are, are looking at the future for the next 46 years, saying, where can we take this thing? How can we do it right here in the center of Silicon Valley? And so, anyway, uh, we've had some a couple of uh, uh, informal meetings with uh, Bruce Wigo from International Swim Hall of Fame, and uh, they're very interested in Santa Clara. They'd like to come. In fact, uh, some of you know that there was uh, some brief meetings back in, I think, 2008, 2009, right before I came on board. Uh, well, now is kind of the fruition of planting some of those seeds back then, and a, and a great opportunity. Um, this is their program, uh, what they have in their current uh, facility. And we'd like to see how and what of this may or may not be uh, good to, to, to bring here to Santa Clara. So that brings us to where we have two, two basic questions for council, council consideration, I call them basically. Uh, number one is, should we bring or uh, uh, invite the International Swim Hall of Fame to come to Santa Clara, anywhere in Santa Clara? It's currently a museum space. Yes, it is attached to an aquatic facility. Um, and they've kind of outgrown that facility. And they're looking for something new and different. Uh, is Santa Clara the right place? Uh, so that's one question. Uh, if so, um, you know, there's some, some study that we need to do to find out really what is, you know, what are their program costs? How well do they operate? What are some of the things that we bring them to Santa Clara that we would expect out of any great uh, organization that we partner with? Uh, what are those expectations and lay that out in some guiding principles that staff then would, would go back should you uh, think that it belongs here in Santa Clara? Um, and then get a formal uh, proposal from them, because currently we don't have that. The second uh, question is, you know, if yes on the first one, then does it make sense where in Santa Clara uh, would, would it go? And uh, there is a potential that uh, the uh, Silicon Valley Aquatics Initiative has uh, had some preliminary discussions with the International Swim Hall of Fame that would say, uh, what can you bring to the table? Um, and uh, we did hear uh, uh, at least some measure of support from former council member Moore. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Cynthia Owens, who's uh, pretty much chairing up the uh, uh, Silicon Valley Aquatics Initiative initiative, uh, and keeping all the clubs together and on the same page and involved in a lot of the discussions and meetings uh, with city staff. So they see that there is a potential commitment from that group to raise about $10 million. Again, we are studying a $40 million or $46 million option. We're also looking back at our $60 million option. Uh, we're also looking at what really should we build, build there, and then how much does that cost? What would that recommendation really come back uh, to you with? And um, we'd have to uh, bring together the business models. Currently, we don't have a, a, you know, a business model that incorporates uh, you know, state-of-the-art museum type features in, in, into the swim center. We are looking at state-of-the-art training facilities because we will, again, the highest levels of competition, we need that. You know, putting trampolines and, and uh, gears onto uh, the deck out there really doesn't serve the diving community well. I mean, they, they still do great, but uh, for the next 46 years, you know, there's some computer uh, uh, models that you can actually you know, use for your stroke improvement and diving improvement and then the synchronized swim, the, the sound system, the boom box on the edge of the, of the deck. Um, well, you know, it doesn't quite work. So there is sound technology as well that we'd love to incorporate into the next design of the International Swim Center for its next 46 years. So if we do that, well then could there be state-of-the-art museum type features as well that are very technologically driven. 
So we do see some opportunities, and we, we do see some challenges, though, in, in bringing those business models together and looking at the swim center for the future. So that brings down to the facility design parameters, construction costs. We really want to uh, fine tune those and come up with a, a design that, that then would meet all of the needs, all of the needs. And then looking at, again, um, the display collection space, obviously, um, uh, we have a lot that, uh, that are, in, in essence, are, come from our swimmers that we'd love to feature here, as well as some of the special events that involves um, the recognition of worldwide you know, swimmers, divers, water polo players, uh, open swim, uh, et cetera, I'm sure, uh, synchronized swim, I'm probably forgetting some, some others as well, and the coaches. Um, so there's that opportunity. The program opportunities, we're, we're also envisioning that, there, that there's an opportunity. We've, we've talked about uh, adding a 50 meter pool. We may, uh, we may need to look at it in terms of almost like a stadium, but I'm not going to say stadium, I'm going to say pavilion, where you can actually host good events, not just good events, but fantastic events, destination type events, where they say, um, when we come to this facility, let's say for the 49th Grand Prix or the 50th, wow, 50th Grand Prix event for swimming, when those Olympic swimmers come here, what are they going to swim in? When they come here, what are they going to dive in? And when they're doing the synchronized swim, or perhaps synchronized diving, uh, what are they going to do? And when we host uh, water polo, maybe NCAA uh, things, where are they going to be uh, in this facility? What's it, what does it mean? What standard does it need to be at? So that's the programming opportunities, the world-class um, event pavilion. But then in order to do that, you need the right uh, operational principles uh, in line, the right staff, the right, you, you need the right stuff. So uh, that's what we mean by facility design parameters, construction costs, really drilling down on that. And the future facility operation plan. We, we need to know what do they bring to the table. Um, a lot of facilities, and this is unfortunate, I've worked for five uh, municipalities, and unfortunately in several of those, we've allowed our facilities through quote unquote deferred maintenance program, we've actually deferred maintenance. Um, and to really do that well, um, you, you can't defer the maintenance on aquatic facilities. Um, they, they are maintained all the time. Um, so one of the things is, so how are we going to pay for that? And really, it's, it's kind of interesting that the International Swim Hall of Fame has talked about bringing to the table uh, perhaps endowments, program endowments, endowments for collections, and you know several different endowment programs. Uh, we'd love to have that opportunity uh, as well as also look at maintenance uh, endowment so that the facility stays at that world class level. Um, and then uh, there's always a concern, you know, well, is it going to cost the general fund anything? Uh, if we do, if we study it well and do it right, uh, the answer should be no. Um, so but we need to get there. So to get there, Council feedback. Uh, I'll just be open to your questions. Um, we need to, you know, have some feedback on the guiding principles. Uh, and you know, do you want it here? Do you want us to work with ISHA? Uh, and then, if it makes sense, do you want it included into the current facility uh, and program study that we're doing? Okay. So that sounds like the open question. You know, I'll kick it off. And absolutely. What a wonderful opportunity. And uh, as far as co-location, you know, I see the I see the synergies of having it co-located uh, into a new facility and integrated into a new facility that's a destination, rather than building a separate facility that we have to build a facility to maintain and obtain. But that's that's my general comments on it. Um, Councilmember Gilmore, then David. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about this. I think besides soccer, swimming is one of the healthiest sports around. But I think it's great. There's so many residents in Santa Clara that use our facility of all ages and all abilities. So I like the fact that if we continue with this, that we have a facility that has our you know children that are babies learning to swim all the way up through our competitive at the competition at the highest level. Uh, which is what we're used to in Santa Clara. I went to the swim center when I was a young child, and actually it looks the same as it did 50 years ago, 40 years ago. 
So it's time to bring it into the next century. Um, I'm really excited about the International Swim Hall of Fame. I think they should be located together if possible. And as we look at uh, master planning in Central Park, um, if that's where it's, everything's going to be located, then um, now's the time to incorporate all these elements into that. So I'm fully supportive and would really like to move ahead. So I guess my general question is, what is the size of the footprint of the museum itself? Do you have any basic idea? I mean, can we reconfigure that? I mean, is there some way? Um, it's current configuration. This is 7,500. That's museum space. Um, okay. When you look at the, the pool space and some of the, this is the uh, Fort Lauderdale and, and uh, the facility uh, as you see it. So uh, certainly we'll get into the, those aspects is how much do you need? So uh, just to leave a creative idea out there, collection space is not necessarily always uh, uh, needed in the same location where you're doing your display space. Uh, you have rotating collections. Most museums uh, do that. In fact, I think our Triton does that very well. So when we're, we, we have, as a city, some experience uh, with that. You, you highlight the things for the event. Uh, it doesn't become stale. Uh, that's one of, I think, the uh, uh, sad aspects of where it's located right now. And perhaps not the visioning that uh, Fort Lauderdale had was to keep those, those displays fresh so as people come in, uh, it's appropriate to the time, either the time of the year, the event that you're doing, uh, and, and keeping it fresh. The rest of the collections, some of those need to be under lock and key. They're very valuable, and they shouldn't be you know, just out there for, uh, for that. So how much space do you need? That will go into our program, I'm figuring, go into the program study and say, how much space is needed to drive both the people there as well as the, the residual dollars that come with them. So going forward, you can give us like an overlay of how this would all incorporate with the swim center itself. Yes, yes absolutely. Okay. And and that, that has yet to be defined because we haven't concluded our program any yet for the new facility. We don't just I don't just assume, I should just say I don't assume that it's gonna be you're gonna have a fifty another fifty meter pool, you're gonna have another X and so much of display space. Uh, that would be very presumptive of myself. I want to make sure that, that the, the numbers drive the process as opposed to you know, saying, well, I think it's X, uh, and then find out that it's not. Um, you shouldn't be bought building stuff that you don't need. We need to build stuff that we absolutely need to hit those two targets, highest level of competition as well as basic recreation programming and, and uh, the learn to swim, as well as water safety, some other programs that we haven't you know, really drilled into the community. I was on the Parks and Rec Commission at the time that this renewal of the Swim Center as well as the proposal for the International Swim Hall of Fame came to fruition had the opportunity to meet with um, Mr. Weigo and also spoken with Todd Spiker and other members of uh, the Board of Directors for the Hall of Fame. Uh, they are very interested, very excited on the prospects of coming to Santa Clara. I'm also more excited about needing to rebuild our swim center. It is a, uh, a heavily used facility that definitely needs to be uh, renewed, refreshed, uh, brought up to uh, not only modern operational standards, but we also need to meet the requirements of USA Swimming for the competitive uh, diving, competitive swimming events, even for synchronized swimming that our facility does not currently meet. So we are losing opportunities to bid those uh, world-class uh, competitions with the way the facility exists today. So I strongly support uh, moving forward in, uh, in the development of the new swim facility as well as uh, continued reaching out to the Hall of Fame and the relocation of Santa Clara. Thank you. Um, so one of my questions, does the International Swim Hall of Fame currently have a lot of their own swim programming or like events like that they would want to bring with them? You know, like are they running a lot of meets or things like that that would conflict with the schedule that the three Santa Clara teams have? Um, I'm going to answer that simply and just say no. I'm usually not short on words, but that was no. There's not a lot that they would bring that would conflict. I see some of the great opportunities 
uh, when you talk about uh, you know the induction ceremonies for the the swimming hall of fame, uh, I was uh, given some material recently too that that showed uh, when they had a, an event that included uh, about 200 uh, Chinese uh, uh, swimmers back from the uh, I guess it was the 70s um, and some of the uh, Hall of Famers and bringing all of those folks together it'd be great to have them in Santa Clara uh, in and around our facilities mm -hmm. I mean it would be great to host that event mm -hmm. uh, at the convention center and then have demonstrations here in this facility so do, uh, is that competing with some of the other activities there I, I don't see them as mutually <coughs> exclusive I see those building uh, on each other. I think it's also a great thing. I mean, we've done it with soccer as well at, at the soccer facility where we have uh, friendlies and that the, the international teams come and they meet and they play together and we have 150, 200 kids that get to see these world-class players and that they're aspiring to and they're going, wow, I get to you know, get my soccer ball signed. I mean, well, I'd love to do that with the, with the swimming community as well to be able to say, you know, look, you, you can get there. You definitely can get there. Uh, and I think that's an element that we, we don't quite have here. Like right. I said, we don't, but I'm going to say we don't quite have that here. Okay, right. So that, that's fine. Those kind of events I don't see in conflict. I just didn't know, since I, all I hear from all the people I know in swimming is the, you know, trying to get water time and, you know, competing for water time. So that was one of my questions. And secondly, I was thinking, you know, I have had some concerns about whether the swim center could be outgrowing where it is in Central Park. Um, it, and if we added, uh, something that would be appropriate for an uh, International Hall of Fame mu museum and all of that, if, if that would take it to a space consideration where maybe that spot in Central Park isn't big enough, um, you know, whether it would be something that would, if we could find, I, I should say this probably, but I, I understand that Mission College is going to be dropping the soccer program, you know, who knows, maybe, but it, you know, where their soccer fields used to be or something like that. I was just, Wondering what your take on the space is. Um, I'd like to see the again the process drive what is needed and then present that back to you to say this is what we need in order to be successful. These are the limitations, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the constraints. Uh, because we also want to make sure that it is an appropriate facility for this location. I do though believe in the design elements that are out there uh, that I have seen that are very creative. Uh, and allow for that to happen. And, so, and have the International Swim Hall of Fame seen the proposals that the Silicon Valley Off-Road Aquatics Initiative have put together? Have they seen those? Uh, yes. In fact, a lot of people like to jump to the design phase before you. I know, have but the I'm just curious. Did yes, they know? Oh, we like it, or we want? Oh, oh no, no, they were very really excited, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I again, you know, temper our enthusiasm so that we can get through the. The study phase of this, include this into that, and get you some really good information and some uh, great recommendations as well. And then you can also then see it, whether or not it's going to work. And then okay. at that point say, well, then we do need X and so much space here or there. Or, oh, wow, it all works. We're not, we're not quite there yet. We're at the getting them involved in the conversation. As long as we don't let the, you know, the, the masters and the seniors, you know, so they can still get these Absolutely. I'm kind of in that age bracket. So you're looking for us to say move forward? Yeah, move forward. That sounds like we're <laughs> about it. All right. Great. As part, of, as part of the next steps, uh, is it possible for us to explore some tax exempt uh, financing uh, opportunities that might be available? Uh, or to maybe come up with a combination of uh, one time monies and maybe be doing some kind of a financial um, mechanism to maybe generate enough capital to uh, to make the improvements. Yeah, anything, any when you put the financial packages together and the options, I mean, that has to be a, that's a critical component, right? Because you can dream it, but you can't build it. That's a, that's an issue. So, uh, absolutely. Is anyone having concerns about that? Or like we all said that's great. Well, I have some ideas, but I kind of want to talk about the financial community first. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Jim. Thank you. Okay. Next, um, presentation of the affordable housing development along the East El Camino Real and partnering with the nonprofit group for affordable housing. Thanks. 
she asked me if I knew how to use it, and I said yes. <laughs> I guess what you want. Um, Didn't know that you use it well. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, so, you know, we've already talked in the past, I think, a couple different uh, times about, you know, what RDA dissolution has done to us in terms of our affordable housing program. And here on the head of the hammer with that one, and then the uh, Palmer case out of Southern California that said you can't do inclusionary zoning. So any of our big projects require them to have kind of transportable. So it does limit us, but it doesn't mean there aren't things that, that you know, we might still be able to do. Um, I wanted to first, and I'll come back to the slide in a minute, but I want to first just highlight some of those properties we know that are out there that are potential affordable housing opportunities. Uh, first, the, the city owned property, the favorite site, which we all know. Um, the senior part of that has not moved forward. Um, Monroe Sanson Law School will be acquired from the county. Sitting vacant uh, downtown properties, of course, we have some in there since we came up with our 2006 plan. Fire station six, actually, uh, uh, Rooms, um, City Hall, depending on what we do with City Hall. Um, Jenner Street, we own a residence over there, and uh, that was uh, being run by Senior Housing Solutions for a long time, and they're no longer in the picture. So, with some of the ones we own, these other ones, I think our opportunities out there where partnering with somebody may mean we come up with some projects um, that um, can include housing and affordable housing. Um, so again, I can come back to some of those and talk about them. But first, let me just um, talk a little bit here about um, some of the concepts that we might have. You know, we, we still have partner opportunities out there. Um, if, even without money, there are ways to do it and there are some other money we can use. Um, wherever we have city-owned properties, and that's an opportunity for us because the cost of land is huge for an affordable housing developer. So if we can put our land into the deal as we've done many times, um, that's great. You know, when you look at a project like Presidio, which just won an award for Grant Boulevard, um, and the Rome Project, Senior Housing, you know, we put about $8 million into those projects, part of it in the land that we purchased and will continue to own on as solution as they go in. Um, and part of it into <coughs> the construction of those projects. So um, that's the classic way that we've um, participated and we could get ownership of the land. Um, again, and that second bullet is kind of the same thing. We can, we can lease those. Um, are there other city funding sources in the third bullet? You know, is there another way um, to do this? Uh, could we find monies elsewhere? I'll leave that out there, but um, it is one possibility since we don't have RDA money. Um, portable down, subsidize, you know, permitting or, or the entitlement process. That's not a huge chunk of money, though. So it may not be enough for most projects, but it certainly could be a component of something if we wanted to have a program to go that way. Um, obviously, the operating costs, reducing power and water coverage rates is something. Again, it's not huge, but. You know, if the council wanted to have something that they could help with the operations, that's the way to do it. Um, the housing trust fund is out there, and you know, Kevin Dwick is always uh, willing to partner with us and do whatever we can do. Um, and, you know, maybe we can do outreach, and maybe our companies like the Intel out there will, you know, work with us directly to provide some kind of funding um, to provide um, money for the projects that we like to do. Let me see if I can back this thing up once. So to go to these and look at them, um, you know, BayRec, our partnership uh, with Methodist Charities, our Methodist uh, Foundation and Charities Housing, um, and it sort of was stalled because of what happened with uh, RDA, but another developer stepping up and may be willing to do uh, some funding, uh, gap financing for that project um, in lieu of doing um, portable units in their own project. So that's an opportunity for us maybe to get BayRec moving. Um, in the Rose Santa Claus side, I always get calls from developers who would like to do something and they're trying to figure out exactly how to do it, but that property is still a possibility and we need to figure out how to do something. Um, downtown will continue to work on that. Uh, Fire Station 6, Phil Cruz, um, that's an interesting one. I just had a meeting today uh, with Jeff Patterson over in housing, along with PAH, who developed the 1000 El Camino at Washington with senior housing. Uh, Gateway Santa Clara. 
Um, they are looking at a partnership with Bill Wilson Center. Um, that's relatively small property. It's only about three quarters of an acre. Um, but they could put 15 units on that that could help uh, uh, disabled, perhaps um, uh, younger people have a place to live, be independent um, on that property. So that is one opportunity that actually can move forward. And the nice part about that property and that opportunity is we still have 1.4 million sitting out there in the home funds that we'll lose come August if we don't do something with it. So with our land in the deal and that 1.4, that could be an opportunity and a quick one to get something going. Um, on some of the private properties, South Drive, um, I, I don't know if you all know that property, but that, that little strip of land um, that sits behind the landscape there in South Drive up against the railroad track. Very thin sliver. It's, in my mind, a very difficult site to develop. We've talked to a number of developers over the years. We've looked at it, but probably they get a good price for it because it's so difficult. You know, it is, it is difficult. Habitat's uh, talked to us. They want to talk to us a little bit more about that site. Um, it's going to be difficult no matter what, and getting access to it is part of that problem. But we'll sit down and we'll talk with them. Um, King's Highway, anybody know where that is? Yeah. King's Highway Hotel, um, that's been a challenge for a while, and we can ask the chief about that. Um, we continue to have to, to monitor that and, and uh, uh, deal with the vandalism and, and homeless activity in that property. Um, the property owner has not been terribly responsive. We are proposal back in 2006 by EAH to go in there and do something with that property. But, you know, we talk to Catholic Charities now. They're interested perhaps in coming in if they can acquire it, to scrape it, build something probably very much like Presidio. So there is an opportunity there as well. We don't know what that costs, you know, how the city can help do that. But certainly we would try to help wherever we can to, to do something like that to clear out a site. Uh, St. Francis and Sterling Motel, I think you know those. Um, I don't know if there's an opportunity there when you talk about talking to the property owner because they're, I think they're making an end on those properties today. Um, it obviously is a problem for us and for the residents around there. We'd like to clean that up, whether that will happen or not. Uh, there may be a few other vacant sites. There are some close to City Hall um, that for some way that entice development there and we can do something about it, that would be great. Um, stationary, of course, <coughs> we're starting to get some interest now, even though BART is not quite ready. Maybe we'll get um, some real interest there. The, the Lukes that own the FedEx site are certainly interested in doing something with their property because FedEx wants to move along. And then, of course, we've got the, the, the two areas in the 2015 general plan, um, Tasman East being one, but that one obviously is being overshadowed by everything going on with related in Montana. So. We're sort of in a wait and see mode on that property, those properties, about 45 acres in there. But over on the west side, as a part of the Sunnyvale Station Area Plan on the Lawrence Station, um, there are a number of those older industrial properties in there that property owners are selling to residential developers. They would want to sort of draw them onto that Sunnyvale Station Area Plan. So that's an opportunity, of course, for housing numbers and probably some affordable housing in that. So those are just a few of the things that are out there that um, we might be able to take advantage of. So what do we do next? Um, um, see what we want to do on the city-owned properties. And I'm not quite sure how you want to do that, but um, with some of the things we have, I think we can bring before you at least some preliminary plans, see what kind of a, a take you have on, on doing that. So work with the city manager and, and bring forward whatever seems to be ready to ask the question of you what we think about a proposal. Um, I don't know if the council wants to get involved in a subcommittee form. We certainly have to deal with the um, housing element as it comes forward. We'll be working on it over the next year, so we will certainly have committee work on that. Um, so you might want to think about whether there's a uh, council interest in participating in some way there. Um, outreach to nonprofits, um, that's another place sometimes where council members can be helpful um, if we put together some kind of a program. Other pool of the money, I don't know what, what else we might consider using of our own dollars, given how tight we are with things now and trying to, to deal with RDA dissolution and payback. Um, you know, the county has some of those monies that um, we had a set aside, housing set aside, and there's been some talk about 
making those available for cities to, to work with um, as we go over time. But we don't know what strings are tied to that offer. So that's something we still need to work through. And then again, as I had mentioned earlier, some some array perhaps of city fees and utility rates to be incentive packages. So that's really all I have for tonight. If there's any questions or you want to move forward on any of these. Well, so then, um, if this were, I have a thought. Um, Long Dale Camino uh, from Lincoln to Harrison, uh, there are properties that are somewhat in distress. And I'm just wondering, I know we have a property fund with some money in it. I was wondering if we could put together a proposal for council where we could use some of that money to buy property, maybe two pieces of property along the El Camino. Maybe we could enter into an agreement with a developer for a fee to build affordable housing for us, and maybe we could tap in, if these funds are still available, Section 202 funds through HUD. Uh, I know my former cities, uh, we built a couple of uh, really nice uh, housing projects in our downtown area using some of that work with the developer. I wonder if you could use that money, uh, build the project, and then and then lease the project to uh, families uh, under the affordable uh, housing uh, uh, guidelines, and then maybe use the proceeds from the lease uh, revenues to either pay debt or to use the money to offset maintenance costs, but also to begin to use some of that money to put into a pot of money to generate future dollars for housing development in the area of affordable housing. I wonder if we could probably explore that. Would that be something that we could take a look at? I think that's yeah, a great idea, especially if you target someplace like the King's Highway. Right. Then you can get rid of the light and the lighting houses. Okay. Yeah. We'll take a look at that kind of an option and yes. see if there's a potential for doing something like that. Speaking of light, at one time we had a $10 million plan to, to renovate what used to be Section 8,000 along Lafayette Street. What's going on with that corridor? Well, I don't know if there's any dollars out there for that at all, but you're right, it, it needs to be dealt with somehow. But there's no plan at this point. And another thing, too, is, is, and I'm not predicting that we're going to generate any money from, uh, from these revenues on the big project that we reviewed earlier tonight. We will do our best uh, to, uh, to try to collect as much rent as possible. But as we generate you know, those dollars, uh, in lieu of putting those dollars back into the operating fund like we did before, maybe we need to look at you know, putting money in reserve, putting money in capital, and then putting money into an economic development fund that we can use to do future development, land acquisition, and whatever incentives the council might want to create to attract more business to Santa Clara. Right. The council members, we do have a city affordable housing fund, which is made up of monies where maybe a developer didn't do a whole unit and they paid us for the portion of the unit that they didn't build. Oh, that, that fund was intended as, as redevelopment was supposed to end in 2026 to have been built up you know, to a point where we could really use it. So we obviously never got there. So you know, it's, it's out there, but it's not huge. Um, the other thing, when we were meeting with the uh, Valley group and uh, Charlotte Ballard was talking uh, effervescently about how the county group receives a windfall as a result of the dissolution of redevelopment and housing. Um, have put money aside to be able to do this purpose, so I say we test their resolve and uh, see if we can partner with them as, as well as others uh, to cobble together the kind of funding because most affordable housing projects that we've done have been very successful, um, have been a combination of funding sources. So I do like the idea of a perpetual fund, of creating some sort of perpetual fund that, that's, that's targeted towards it um, as well. So I, I think that's a great idea. Affordable housing is critical for us. Okay. And have we thought about, like, with the smaller project, you know, we have the, the over 10 years dedicated so many units of work. I mean, instead of doing that on small projects, have we thought about just doing it more in fees? Like, rather than have the developer build an affordable unit on a 12 unit project, pay for that. And then we can start building up some of our own. I could speak to that. Um, the, the legality of doing that is in flux right now. San Jose is inclusionary ordinance in front of the California Supreme Court. Kevin alluded to the fact the Palmer decision ruled that inclusionary requirements as it relates to rental housing is preempted by state law, so that's, that's done for. Um, but um, as far as ownership goes, um, I think where that's headed is those are going to be treated like developer fees or exactions from, from developers that have to actually go out and do impact studies. 
for those. Yeah, our ownership part of it actually has been pretty good. What we lost with redevelopment was the ability to fund first time homebuyers. So it did harm that program as well as when they provided some income portable price. And you also raised the uh, possibility of the Wilson Center expansion replacement. Uh, that there was some low hanging fruit there as well. I think that we should pursue any, any, think that we, any opportunities that we have to provide affordable housing, um, especially since we have $1.4 million dedicated to affordable housing that we otherwise lose, we might as well make the investment in our community while well, there's an opportunity. Right, I, I think that property is a little too small to do much of anything else with, and we bought it with um, RDA set aside funds, so it seems like a good way to go. Any additional questions? Everybody want to go get the King's Highway Motel? It's Okay, they took a lot of characters out of that. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, moving down to the five-year plan for Silicon Valley Power. Okay. Thank you very much. Just Kevin just figured this out. Hopefully I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got a whole ton of stuff I could talk to you about. Uh, Yvonne said I could have to have him through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I thought it sounded like Yvonne. No, I don't. <laughs> there's, there's a number of things, you know, we, we could cover, you know, resource plans and renewals and uh, how we integrate those, public benefits, staff and succession plan, land structure. All fascinating uh, topics, but I'll try to do a brief overview of uh, things here. My goal is actually to try to keep Kevin away until I'm done. So, um, the, uh, what I want to do is, uh, first of all, just hit some of our, our capital plans as we move forward here. So, and just, uh, just to keep our, our distribution system and our generation plants running. It takes about eight to ten million dollars a year in capital improvements, you know, just just to keep the, the infrastructure in place. That could be everything from you know, overhauling engines to uh, you know keeping the distribution system in, in service and, and so on, uh, and capital maintenance of our, our substations and so on. We also do about five million dollars a year in technology upgrades. Now a lot of that right now is going into advanced meter infrastructure, the motor almost four million dollars a year there. But then we also GIS you know, systems enhancing our fiber network are, are also also there. Um, we then uh, are continuing our program of uh, you know, rebuilding and, and expanding our, our substations. And a number of projects here, sub Sarah substation is up on Ag near Agilent property, so we're going to rebuild it from the ground up. If some of the equipment's in there, it's 50 years old. Fairview substation is a project moving forward. It's driven by some data center load, but it'll be a general substation in the area to serve additional load there. Then we have future stations like Esperanza substation, which actually will be located on our northern seating station right behind the, uh, um, the stadium. And that would actually be the, the substation that would serve the uh, related development, Montana and related developments. So we'll move that you know, forward when those developments uh, move forward. Because uh, that uh, those developments could add, you know, um, five, six, seven, maybe ten percent to our load in, in the city with, with those developments there. But we have the structure and the locations for the infrastructure to serve those. Um, now we got a number of Rebuilds that are sitting just in order, following following those. Uh, the phase shifting transformer we talked uh, a lot about. That's basically a device that will help us reduce our transmission costs. It'll have a fairly quick payback with uh, the uh, for utility purposes. You know, five six year payback. Uh, so that project's uh, you know moving forward here. Not these days. So we also, again, in other areas, you know, there's a lot of going on in the greenhouse gas areas and climate change. You know, we continue to uh, work on our energy efficiency and solar and electric vehicle programs. We're trying to grow our, our Santa Clara Green Power program. We also do a fair amount of work in trying to optimize uh, how we participate in the cap and trade business in, in greenhouse gas emissions. It, they capped it. 
and we are, have allowances, but then there's active auctions and so on. And you can sell and buy allowances there. So we're trying to optimize our, our value there of our, our allowances and so on. But there's also a ton of uh, record keeping that goes with all this, and RPS and, and greenhouse gases and so on. And, and we just sent in on, on the 31st uh, uh, tomorrow, this is the first deadline for a bunch of RPS report, reporting. So it's just a lot of work going along with that. So we're trying to streamline that, get the system set up so we can keep up on, on that the type of reporting. And we're also having active negotiations going on with our San Juan coal fire plant, you know, as we're as there. Another major area that, that we're dealing with is national reliability standards. So these are set up by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, delegated to the National Electric Reliability Corporation, and on and down. But they are mandatory standards that apply to us. And again, it, it, it kind of it's changed a little bit of the way we do business. We used to have to be, we used to characterize it as a bunch of smart people and a kind of find a system that knew everything about it. So we knew how to react and deal with things. Now we're being driven into a, a procedures-based uh, approach. Everything has to be documented. And you have to not only have procedures documented, but you have to document that you're following in you know, procedures. So, so very, very intensive there. And so that's where we've got, you know, we're, we're trying to set up those systems so that we're, we're on top of all that. And uh, we're also, uh, you know, you've got to get all the buy-in from all the employees in the utility around and, and we get that culture of compliance with these things. And I think we're doing very well, you know, there. So that's uh, a major issue going forward. Um, yes. Some of this I touched on before, infrastructure and technology, we, we are continuing to move forward, advanced metering program and our utility communications infrastructure. Uh, we're also looking at street lights. So we're looking at street lights on the El Camino Real to, to enhance those and go to decorative street lights. We're also taking a look at uh, LED conversions in other parts of the, the city. <coughs> and the other thing we're doing is we're going through a lot of our, our resources and our assets. A lot of assets that we that that were very valuable to us for a great number of years, with the ISO and the new markets in place, their value has changed. So we're actually reviewing those assets and seeing which ones that we need to modify the way we use them. Um, you know, either you know, lay off or assign portions of you know of them to others so that we can get better value out of those those assets. So we, we have a number of those those. Uh, activities ongoing on. And then we have just the general, you know, keeping look at our, our business you know, structure and so on. Everything from keeping track of our bond ratings and our, our finances. Uh, you know, last night we transferred some money just to increase our coverage. I mean, we have the, we have the money budgeted, we made, made our budget, we made our bond covenants and everything, but for appearance purposes, for coverage ratio purposes, we trans, transferred some money last night. Um, but then we also next year want to go in and actually review our rate structure because things are changing. Just like we talked about a little bit last night with renewables coming on and so on, it really changes the way the value of the utility model you know works. So we really need to take a look at how we collect the revenue and, and so on. So we make sure that we stay viable you know as, as we move forward. So we, we plan to take a look at that and then. Uh, Always on ongoing things to review your staffing and resource levels, and some of that it looks at. There's a number of things that we have contractors on on board that we're doing. And maybe we can bring them on to staff. You know, those types of decisions are, are things that we need to, to review right now as we go forward. So that was a really quick overview, that was covering a lot of territory, but. Um, Happy to answer any questions, or we can always go deeper on any of them. Debbie has questions. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rock. I was the one that asked for this five year plan. Right. And the only reason I did was because of all the development that we're doing out at Northside. And the one thing we do not want to happen is no electricity on a Super Bowl night and be embarrassed by national <laughs> Right. <language>. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I know that there's going to be a lot, and I, I heard that you, you, you're putting another substation out there, which is really good. Um, I learned from Alan the other day that we have to have a really good rainy season so that we have the hydro going. And so I'm starting to learn more about what's going on with the electric. 
Um, thank you for doing this for me. It kind of gives me like this overall thing, what you're doing. Um, but the community outreach thing, I think I was more concerned with the meters. Right. When that, that came to council and um, Ann probably got hammered yeah. on that one. But um, I think that when we do projects like that, is there some way that you could let us know as council before you start to roll some of that stuff out a little bit so that we can answer the questions of the public? Because they do come to us and say, I don't know about those sport meters. I don't know what they're going whatever. And right. we need like talking points on that kind of uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that one in particular, you know, we do have a plan to come back to you and uh, and talk to you about it and actually get your input into it. Because we do have some options, uh, you know, with, with what we can do as far as allowing customers to opt out of that program or not. Uh, we we uh, have proposed kind of a proposal to you, uh, presented it. And you guys had some very good questions you know, on that. So we plan to bring that back to you and have, so we can have that discussion and, and make sure you're all involved. And I think we, we should do that, make sure that you guys are informed on when we roll all this down in the future. And I know that uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Pat's guaranteed me that the lights are not going to go out <laughs> during the Super Bowl game. <laughs> so I, I know. Is that what he tells you? That's what he tells me. He gave you his checkbook, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just gave him four million last night. <laughs> Do we have any other uh, questions? <coughs> yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, the flip side of the uh, the meter controversy is the fact that it does enable us, or that the way that that happens is by having a Wi-Fi capability throughout Santa Clara. And I think one of the things that we can do is provide a service to our residents, particularly our lower-income families that may not be paying for um, you know, cable internet through ATT, whatever that a provider, and I, you know, I've had some discussion with some people about that. That that would be something that I think would be a plus in the community if we had funds available to invest in that. So that um, you know, I'm not talking about doing Netflix downloads, but so that you know, some people could do basic have basic internet service through the Wi-Fi to do homework assignments or whatever, something you know like that. So I think that that's a very valuable asset that we can provide the community. Yeah, it, and that is one of our the council objectives, you know, going forward is look at how we can enhance this. I didn't want to go back to this slide and just point to that map on the lower uh, right hand side there. That's called the heat map. That that's our 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 Wi-Fi coverage of the city, you know, right right now, and we're. we're tried to analyze that further. We actually were actively updating what we call again the heat map, our coverage and looking at how we can, can fill some gaps in areas where we, we have less. Now it was never was at this point in time intended for really indoor, you know, use is really more of a you know an outdoor mobile Wi-Fi, you know, purpose. But we do have Good coverage, so you know we can look at these goals and see how we can, you know, expand it. And so it is available for. for <coughs> like it doesn't have to be Netflix ready, but just right. Wikipedia ready. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that's an issue. We do have six thousand distinct users using this any day, every day, uh, on the system uh, so so far. And we do have to kind of look the download, you know, price because you do get people who. Do come on and they, they use it for whatever purpose or they're just downloading tons of information at times we have to actually disable you know those some of those apps. So it is an issue. And just as an example though, it, it isn't you know met from speed, but it was <coughs> very basic and uh, uh, the River Life Church so uh, Acer had donated uh, 40 laptops that they gave away to low income families from San Bernardino Public School District. And the uh, feedback <coughs> from fabulous from the parents just being able to get on school and, and do the basic things and set up an appointment. So it's transformative, but I know that we all like to see it be wickedly fast right? Um, yeah, in the future. So it enhancements as time goes on. Um, do we need more information? Because knowledge is power literally this time. Great job. Right. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on to item number six, discussion about the meeting in the council ad hoc committee for the resolution of the form of party. Uh, yes, Mr. Members of Council, um, I think uh, as we started to compile uh, a number of topics for the work session, I, uh, I, I know that when you received this request from a council member, 
unfortunately, as I get older, I'm, I tend to forget things now. I can't remember who suggested it, but but it was really right at the heart of, uh, of some of the issues that we were dealing uh, with as it relates to the wind down. Uh, but we have been briefing council on, on the wind down. We are making tremendous uh, progress. Um, and uh, if you would like for us to um, convene uh, an ad hoc committee, you could do so. But it's really at your discretion. Well, the, the council as a whole is making decisions on when goes on the rocks. The council as a whole in our in litigation is in closed session making decisions give direction. Then we have three of the council members um, uh, serving on the oversight board, so we have quite a bit of council coverage on that. Because of the progress that we've made, I'm not sure that it makes much sense to add another layer, but I'll leave it up to the council. I'm, I'm well, it was me. <laughs> and this is a lot of shock. <laughs> but we've come a long way. So, but this was a, this request was yeah. a long, long time ago. Right. Yeah, okay. like a dinosaur's age, it feels like. Okay, this is an easy one. Move down to number seven then. Presentation of IT's effort to replace 1% of the computers with current technology. You know if I looked over to you, but you guys. You know, I'm actually I know this is the most exciting part you've been waiting for. I will make it very fast. So, we've been differing uh, hardware maintenance, software maintenance as an austerity measure for the past few years. It's caught catching up with us, so we're finally giving it the attention. And we had a two phase project. One was 50% uh, of the computers in the first uh, reporting period that we had from March to September, and now we're in the second reporting period to replace 100% of the computers. And part of the background here is we're eight-year-old computers and 10-year-old software. It's no wonder we had a lot of employee frustration, and we need to address that and address that fast uh, before uh, Windows XP goes out of uh, of support in on April 8, 2014. So we have a few more months. Um, and we wanted to do it in a way that we standardize city systems. We had a little bit of different departments with different flavors of software. It added to a whole lot of support uh, cost and effort. We, and there was 800 computers, all different. It's very hard to support them. So we wanted to standardize them, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, do it in a way that is not about hardware and software replacement, it's about the people who are actually using the computers and software. So a lot of emphasis on training, a lot of emphasis on getting them to use the tools, and approach this as more than a hardware software replacement, but as a, like Amir just said, a transformative project where we were empowering the end users with the right tools to do their jobs rather than just throw software and hardware at them. So um, the good news is we're at 61%, actually a little higher uh, of that uh, total goal. Um, we, we've done a lot of hard work. Um, we're doing this project in departmental phases. So we've got all the departments on the, on the, on the slide here. Um, so far, um, the users have been very happy with it. We've, been, we've broken a few things, most uh, recently in the police department. I know Mike's appreciative of that. Uh, but we're quickly responding to fix those things. And it's a lot of function of, we don't know what's in those computers, so when we discover it at the last minute, we're doing our best to, to fix it. The part of the project that we also took a great deal of effort was, we actually branded a project called C-Simply. And we wanted it to be more than just a new PC. And so it's about connecting, collaborating, and creating simply. And it's an entire campaign to make it software on the users to deal with the change management. So we're replacing computers, giving training, showing them how to improve their productivity. And once we replace these computers, which we're on track for, um, we have the funding, thank you, um, for the rest of the computers. The second phase after this entire project is replacing the telephone system for the city. So at that point, the lines get blurred between computer and phone, et cetera. So we're on track. So that's it, and thank you. Wonderful, and great progress. Any questions? Uh, great job. I will say he is a delight to work with. And he really <laughs> loves his job. He does an incredible, incredible job for us. And uh, he's taken on a huge problem, but we're really making progress. So uh, <coughs> I, I would really like to commend him for his effort. So, so when do we get to eliminate all the paper? <laughs> <laughs> we're working on that. We're kind of low on the list there. Yeah, <laughs>
if Councilman Davis didn't give the staff all his assignments, we would have saved oh, 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 here it comes out. Oh, 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 So I'm the office of the council. That's where we normally do these type of uh, a smaller group of work on it, and then bring recommendations to the council. Is is that what we're talking about, or is it something different? Because I, I don't remember this. I thought that you brought recommendations. Where is this? Do we I know Yvonne. Uh, would you like to give us an update? She did some work uh, on restructuring and. Uh, well, one of the things is that this was exactly written on the last um, six months that would be doing the strategic plan. So we did do what the council, um, three council members who had convened to look at the International Exchange Commission and Cultural Advisory Commission. Those are the primary. That has been done very successfully and it has been incorporated with the international flavor to it. So you'll be seeing programs brought out such as for the summer program, doing some of our cultural groups here in the city to be able to meet their needs and some of the art programs that the Culture Commission already does in conjunction with our sister cities. So we're continuing with that, but did we really answer what the council was looking for when you are saying uh, possible re you know, um, uh, restructuring of the commissions as a whole? Julio has met with a couple of, of in uh, commissioners. Uh, really what they're purpose of meeting with them was to let them know that um, they are, some of them like our uh, Parks and Rec Commission, uh, the project that they're working on, but I don't know if we're ready for a restructuring and then they seem to be doing what their mandates are for each of the commissions. So other than reaching out to the commissioners themselves, which is a whole different dialogue. Thank you, because I raised some questions about this because we, lucky we've seen any number of times with committees and commissions where we don't have people apply. And rather than continue, you know, what I went, I was one of the people who brought this up, I don't think this like an assignment, but we, you know, I brought it up, uh, is that I think that we, you know, need to look at, we did this one merger, which I think this is, was the right thing to do, but are we giving people what they consider meaningful work to do, you know, as I always say, if you ask somebody to volunteer, make sure that they're gonna have something important to do. Because I know even one of the committees that I chair is the Bicycle Advisory Committee. And, you know, there's comments, and I think we have very good dialogue. It's, a, you know, heck, at the last meeting, you know, I mean, we had like six or seven people that applied for one opening. I mean, that's an engaged group of people. And uh, the staff may think that they're a little too engaged, um, but, I mean, our, at our last meeting, we probably had 20 people there to talk about issues related to bicycling. So they care about that. One of the things that they said to me, though, was we don't want to come here and just ratify, you know, that the work is already done and, and because they have to do, somebody has to approve the grant. Yeah. So I'm saying, how do we find ways to meaningfully get people to participate? And, you know, that there, maybe there's other areas that we should be looking at. Like a, you know, other cities have, you know, we've talked a lot about green issues. Other uh, other cities have sustainability commissions, or you know, a variety. Of things. So that's what when that's what I was thinking of. Beyond that was to look at are there areas that we're not covering that we should be covering, and make sure that we make it a, a meaningful experience so that the work gets passed. That yes, it's worth your time to serve on a committee or a commission. Okay. I just uh, I spoke to Julio about this briefly just the other day, and my concern was city commissions that are looking to expand their jurisdiction to include a lot of other duties that aren't enumerated in their charge. And I don't know, I think, number one, the poor person from city staff that's assigned as the liaison with those committees should remind the committees that, you know, this is really beyond the course and scope of your duties. This is not what you're charged to do. And then I think that the council should probably, if we are going to increase the duties and responsibilities of a city commissioner, that the council should approve it going forward. And uh, that, that's all I was concerned about. 
beyond that, when we did that review and Yvonne led us through that process at the subcommittee level, and we reviewed all of the commissions, actually there are very few that we can alter without changing the charter because they're in the charter. And their duties and responsibilities, composition, all of that, their very existence is charter driven, so you have to put it to a vote of people to change our charter to change those commissions. Uh, so I, there was very little we could do other than combine those two, which were not charter committees. Now, if there are if there are tasks or, or, or you know subject matters that we think we ought to be looking at, like sustainability, you know maybe we can look at the existing committees and commissions and slot that stuff in. I mean, it seems to me green energy and that kind of uh, conservation kind of issues fits well with bicycle advisory commission, which is sort of misnamed because of, you know, but, but maybe that's the right commission to, or committee to put that in because those are the things that those folks care about. So, you know, if there are needs that are wanting, maybe we can put them into the existing commission structure that we have. So then do we keep the ad hoc committee that we had to continue this process? Well, Teresa, well, yeah. well, we have, well, we have a, it's a standing committee. It's been a standing committee for a number of years, uh, the Commission Review Committee. And it, part of its duties was to look at, um, so this could be this could be a task that we could delegate to them to look at. Um, and that would be, I think, the appropriate thing. Also, uh, well, this is about the time of year that I'll be sending out a, a, a memo to all of you to say, here's our list of commissions that are open. Which ones do you want off of? Which ones are you really interested in being on? Um, that's our normal thing that we start doing this time of year. So uh, I think there's a number of opportunities for people to move around and, and, and look at that. And the commissioner would be funny. I'm not really sure who's on it right now, to be honest with you. I know Pat, Pat, Pat you were you on it? I don't remember. It hasn't met. It hasn't met, for, it hasn't met for a while, but that's, that's the place that we delegated because these issues do come up. Um, have come up over the years, and it's a, it's a good place to get the council committee, and it's um, closer to policy setting. So that's what, so I'd recommend that, that we refer this to that committee soon. We find out who the heck they are. <laughs> Does that sound fair? All right. Is there are there any other issues from staff? If not, we're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.